better understand how AutoML systems work and obtain insights that can be used to improve them. Text alignment is a fundamental technique in many text-related domains. In this survey, we cover three text alignment scenarios, collision task, text reuse detection, and transition alignment. On the basis of those scenarios, we review the existing text Hi everyone, welcome to the IEEE VIS 2020 TDK tutorial. My name is Julian Tierney, I am a research scientist with the French Center for Scientific Research and I'm the founder of the Topology Toolkit and I will briefly introduce the tutorial. So this tutorial presents TTK, which is a uh, toolkit for the topological analysis and visualization of data. And as long as you have data that is defined on meshes or on things that can be meshed, then TTK can be useful for you. So TTK implements a substantial collection of algorithms from a family of techniques known as topological data analysis. And these techniques can be viewed as a uh, sort of Swiss army knife for feature extraction in data. In particular, this family of techniques has been fairly successful in the past thanks to their robustness, their multi-scale nature, and their ability to easily express features of interest. So for the last two decades, there's been a growing interest in academia for this set of techniques. Back in 2008, only 10% of the papers that were published at SciViz were dealing with topological methods. And last year, it was around 25% of the papers. There's also Topo in Viz, uh, which published more than 100 papers over the years. And the last edition was in Sweden in, in 2019. And you can see uh, a uh, picture uh, right here. There's also a growing interest in the applications as well as with a few companies which started to implement topological methods in their software products. Regarding TTK itself, um, it's a bit difficult to quantify its impact in practice since only a few indicators are available, but these indicate that there seems to be some interest from universities, governmental institutions, and private companies. So the development of TTK started in late 2014, and we used it internally for a few years before releasing it open source in 2017 under a permissive license, a BSD license. TTK is written in C++, and so far 15 different institutions contributed to the code, including three private companies. In terms of installation, we recommend to install TTK from source. It roughly takes an hour, and we provide step-by-step -step instructions on the website. We also provide, since last year, a Docker image, an Anaconda package, and very soon, binary packages for Ubuntu. We also provide a VirtualBox image, which is available on the, on the tutorial website, and which is fully installed with Ubuntu and the current development version of TTK. So the VirtualBox image is a large file, and if you haven't downloaded it already, we strongly recommend that you do it right now. In the virtual system, you'll find in the TTK directory all the necessary data for the hands-on sessions. And if you need help, please don't hesitate to ask us on the tutorial chat. On the tutorial web page itself, you'll also find the uh, data package for the hands-on. 
which includes uh, data sets and card view state files. You'll also find all the remaining material of this tutorial, which includes the actual slides that we're presenting to you, and all the data and software packages. So what's new in TTK? Well, at the surface, not so much, but under the hood, a lot happened over the last year. So we completely revamped our internal API to make it simpler, easier to use, and more convenient for newcomers. And Jonas will present that in more details. There's been a major work from Kitware to port TTK to the new versions of VTK and ParView. And on top of that, we came up with major performance improvements dealing with various low-level optimizations with the Morse map complex, our triangulation data structure, and our internal representation of scalar data. So overall, for some of the examples which are available on the TTK website, we observed a 10 times speed up with regard to the original 2017 release. In terms of new features, we'll have very soon uh, Ubuntu packages, and we also have a new backend for the topological simplification of data, which is based on the paper that will be, that will be presented this year at this, and which provides further important performance improvements. Regarding this tutorial in particular, we updated our material to the latest version of TTK. At the time we're shooting this video, we're using the development branch of TTK, which is likely to be available as a 0.9.9 version at the time you're watching this video. The tutorial schedule includes new features, new ways to interact with TTK, and how to interact with the latest API. So the tutorial will be organized around three sessions. First, we'll review the basics regarding topological methods in PowerView which is the default user interface to TTK. And next, we'll proceed to hands-on sessions, and finally, we'll present advanced usage. We wish you a nice tutorial. Hi, my name is Attila Yulakshi. I'm a research scientist at the Ski Institute at the University of Utah, and I'd like to thank Julian for inviting me to give the Introduction to Topology-Based Analysis talk. I myself am not a contributor to TTK. However, I have been involved in uh, topology-based analysis for almost two decades and I'm excited for what TTK is doing in terms of bringing topology-based analysis methods to the larger scientific community. So why do we do topology-based analysis? Well you can think of uh, abstraction as a continuum from data which is actually just voltages on chips all the way to language, which is the uh, where we actually do our critical thinking and problem solving, where you could think of the first layer of abstraction being, you know, representing voltages at ones and zeros, then grouping those into floating point values that are distributed spatially. Um, going from the other end, you can tell a domain scientist the word tetrahedrain, and the chemist will know that's a C4H4 molecule, which is a tetrahedral arrangement of carbon atoms with hydrogen sticking off of them. And there's certain levels in this abstraction stack which are better for programming or better for problem solving. And this is what topological analysis does in terms of data analysis. It provides a language for reasoning about the kinds of features that are in our data uh, to make concrete uh, uh, analysis. So let's give an example of this. On the left side, we see a satellite image of the University of Utah. And on the right side is a map representation of the same thing. For the task of finding directions, the map view is uh, much more useful because you can write a combinatorial algorithm to solve the shortest path problem and it gives you a result that is easily interpretable and repeatable. However, in general, scalar functions don't come with their own, or, or scientific data doesn't come with its own uh, streets and intersections representation. This is where topology comes in. These are intrinsic properties of of uh, functions uh, that can be encoded in something like a street, street map. Uh, here, for instance, I show two encodings. One is based on gradient features, that's the Morse-Mail complex, and then the other is the contour tree, which is based on contour-based features. So past applications of uh, topology-based analysis have included everything from molecular analysis to materials analysis, battery design, uh, neural pathways, uh, looking at additive manufacturing technique evaluation, geologic interpretation, this barely scratches the surface of the things that topology can be applied to. So what the heck is topological analysis anyway? 
We've all heard the cliche that to a topologist, the coffee mug is the same as the donut. And this is because there's one single connected component with one uh, non-contractible cycle or loop. Just the same way on the top left here, the two blobs doesn't have the same topology as the one blob. And this is based on a notion of connectedness, where if you pick any two points inside the single blob, you can find a path also inside the blob to connect them. Whereas for the two blobs, you could pick a pair of points where there doesn't exist a pathway that connects them inside the blob. So connectedness is one topological attribute. Uh, by the same logic, the star is the same as the blob because any two points you pick in there can be connected by a pathway inside the, the star. Uh, and uh, uh, same thing for the blob. The coffee mug is not equal to the blob because I can pick a cycle or a closed loop in the coffee cup donut uh, that is not contractible. That is, you can't squeeze it down to a point. Whereas any closed loop inside of my blob, you can contract down to a point. So topology then tells you about the connected components, the cycles of various dimensions, etc. Again, you might ask, well, what the heck does this have to do with my scalar valued or vector valued data? Well, for scalar valued data, uh, what we could look at is the anatomy of a scalar function. So the topology of a scalar function relates to the topological changes during a filtration. Here I have a typical 1D scalar function uh, defined over some domain, uh, and the, the, the function values are the range. Now what a filtration does is I'm going to include successively more pieces of my subdomain uh, that are less than or equal to a filtration value. So as I sweep this value from minus infinity to positive infinity, what happens is more and more pieces of my subdomain are included in, in the, uh, the subdomain. And if I pause this animation right after we go through a minimum value, you'll notice here on the x-axis, a connected component of the subdomain appears. As we go past other critical minimal values, other pieces appear. So now the topology of my subdomain has changed in that the number of connected components has increased. As I pass a maximum value here, uh, two, two of my uh, connected components that I had earlier merge together. And so again, the topology of the subdomain changes. Again, another maximum merges more connected components, etc., until you've uh, uh, your subdomain equals the entire domain. Okay, so now we see how this, the, the topology of the subdomain actually changes during this filtration. Uh, we can also look at the persistence of a topological feature, which is how, how at feature, how long it persists in our filtration during the sweep. So for instance, this minimum appeared at a minimal value as its own connected component, and it was merged into another connected component, so the, the unique topological or unique connected component disappeared at a maximum. So this unique connected component only existed for a short time in the filtration. And the difference in function value is called the persistence. And this we can apply this uh, thinking to everywhere where the topology of our subdomain changes. And what this does is create a pairing of critical points between the birth of a feature and the death of a feature. And one nice thing about topology is now that we've encoded the abstract representation of when uh, features are, are born and die, we can start thinking in terms of topological scales as well. For instance, I can think about what is this function look like if I were to remove the small pieces or small topological features. Uh, we could simply remove those from the abstraction and see what the function looks like at, at these various topological scales. So here I've removed two of my small feature, uh, features and what we have is a function with two maxima and three minima rather than uh, three maxima and five minima. Or sorry, four and three. Okay, so now we know 
that topology is roughly related to the, or, or in applying topology to scalar values, we're really talking about the topology of, of this filtration. What the heck is it good for? Well, the basic notion is that the features of interest in my scientific study are going to be related to my topological features. For example, we already saw that critical points encode the birth and death of topological components. And, uh, and for, for the critical points occur where the gradient is zero, so little flat pieces of the function. And in one dimensions, we have maxima and minima. So working with just the critical points, we may want to learn uh, how features are distributed by their function value inside of this function. And one thing that lets us do that is a persistence diagram. So a persistence diagram takes a single pair of critical points, a minimum and maximum in this case, and puts it on a plot where on the x-axis you have the function value of the birth of that feature and on the y-axis the death of that uh, the function value of the death of that topological feature. And what you notice here is that small features like the orange and the purple are mapped closer to the diagonal than large features like the red, green, and blue. So just looking at the persistence diagram tells you where in the function value range the large and small features are distributed. And this can provide a useful signature for your, your function. Another way to look at this uh, similar data is put persistence on the x-axis uh, and the count of the number of minima or number of maxima on the y-axis. And this is called a persistence plot. And this is another kind of signature which also can tell you where there are stable thresholds. Maybe there's an, there's a, the phenomena under study actually has, you know, natural topological scales at which features appear. And these could appear as flat regions in the persistence plot where the intuition is if you move your persistence simplification threshold a little bit to the um, higher or lower, the, for instance, the count of features doesn't change. So maybe this motivates you saying that this is actually a stable analysis result in, in uh, topological scales. Another way uh, we could use the topology to analyze a function is to look at the actual components that are that are created and when uh, they merge. So here I'm simply coloring the domain based on a unique identifier for the connected component uh, during this filtration. This is called a join tree and the abstraction is shown right here in this uh, tree. Now what this lets us do is do some interesting analysis. For instance we can look at uh, just the leaves of this tree. This gov gives us a notion of uh, the spatial extents of local features. So we could define something called a local valley based on the connected component created by each of the minima. We can even do this in the context of persistence. For example, by removing this small persistence pair here, uh, corresponding to removing this, what we've actually done is just look at a subtree of the connected component. And this lets us answer questions, for example, what is the local value at a particular topological scale at persistence x? Of course, we can play the same sweep from positive infinity to minus infinity. Um, and uh, this gives us the split tree, which gives us a means of defining uh, something like a local peak uh, related concept is uh, decomposing uh, uh, the domain into locally monotonic regions. So here what I'm showing is basically each of these segments, uh, the plot between the critical points is monotone, uniformly uh, increasing. Uh, and this divides our domain into nodes, which is the critical points, and arcs, which are monotone pieces between them. So this is a cell complex. Now what we can do is, is take uh, critical points. For example, if I take a maximum and the monotone cells around it, I can define something like mountains, which provides the decomposition that we see here. 
Uh, or I could take the monotone pieces around minima and uh, create a decomposition into basins. And this is often known as the watershed transform. And just as with the, the join and split trees, we can also do this for, uh, for basins and mountains at, a, at some specified persistence and their rules governing how these regions merge. Okay, so what does all of this look like in 2D and 3D? Because 1D functions are only so interesting. Well, for a two-dimensional function, we can play the same exact game, which is uh, we can start a sweep. Sorry, just skip the slide here. So we'll sweep from minus infinity to positive infinity, and our pink region here is the subdomain with function value lower than our, our, our sweep value. And again, what we'll notice is that, you know, at minima, features or connected components appear, and then at saddles, they merge together. Uh, another possible topological change now is there are saddles that do not merge to distinct connected components, but instead complete a loop. Uh, so here are the loops I've circled at this one particular filtration threshold. So again, here's the notion that critical points uh, occur where the topology of the subdomain changes. And now, uh, as the, the function value goes past the maximum, you have holes that get filled in. Uh, the monotonicity in 2D uh, is a generalization of the one-dimensional monotonicity, where I take my contours and now I break them up into monotone chunks based on integral lines. So an integral line is simply a curve that is tangent to the gradient at every point. And uh, here I've drawn them in also. You'll notice they're orthogonal to the contours. And if I take the pieces of the contour that flow uh, according to these integral lines from the same uh, origin to the same destination, so the upper and lower limits uh, of this integral, then I can start dividing my domain uh, based on this equivalence relation. So here's a coloring of all the pixels based on uh, unique regions in terms of uh, uh, origin and destination in the gradient flow. What this actually is, is a segmentation of the domain into a cell complex uh, where we have quadrilateral patches that are bounded by arcs, which are then bounded by nodes. This is another way to encode the topology of the, uh, the scalar function. Okay, so now I have my two-dimensional scalar function. We could do the same exact kind of games we played in 1D in terms of the kinds of things we can uh, study about the topology. We can look at persistence curves, which now have uh, maxima count and minima count. We could look at persistence diagrams, which now show the minima one saddle persistence pairs as well as saddle maximum persistence pairs. And we can do our same join trees, split trees, and uh, the contour tree, which is the, the tracks the evolution of individual contours, not pieces of the subdomain. So here I've drawn the trees embedded inside the domain, and one can start imagining how if we wanted to extract different kinds of features from our scalar function, we could uh, query this tree structure and the associated segmentation of the domain in certain ways. Uh, and our monotone, monotonicity also gives uh, another way of segmenting the domain, which I'll go into in a little bit. So what can we do? identify as, as a phenomena features uh, in terms of the join tree and split tree. So here are the base segmentations they give. One thing we can do is look at our local valleys again and what they look like in 2D. In this case, we identify uh, uh, the regions associated with leaves of our tree or entire subtrees. This gives us a local threshold for identifying something rather than global thresholds. So this could be more adaptive to uh, the particular intensities in the function. Here's the definition of the local peaks uh, illustrated. And you'll notice there is no global threshold which would give me the segmentation. It is purely adapted to the, the local nature of the data. Uh, for the more smell complex, now again, we can group the monotone regions around a maximum to give us mountains. 
the boundaries of those regions gives us valley lines. We could group the monotone regions around a minimum to give us basins or the watershed transform. And the boundaries of that gives us ridge-like structures. Oops. Now, I'm not going to go through the animation in 3D because it becomes really complicated to see the, or, or uh, like everything is self-occluded when we do the filtration, but we could take a three-dimensional function like this eight Gaussians arranged in a cube and play the same games. We're here, the join and split tree allows us a certain kind of segmentation, just as in uh, 1D and 2D. Uh, now in 3D, we have four kinds of critical points. We have minima, maxima, and two kinds of saddles. So the persistence diagram will reflect that kind of pairing. We can also do persistence curves in 3D. <clears throat> the more smell complex, in addition to having our usual mountains, valleys, ridge lines, and valley lines, also has saddle connectors. So saddle, saddle lines, uh, ridge surfaces, and valley surfaces. So these ridge surfaces separate mountains and the valley surfaces separate uh, the basins. Okay, so we've defined a bunch of uh, topological abstractions uh, that are intrinsic to scalar functions. How do we actually use this in analysis? Well, the first step is to start translating back from things a scientist might be uh, interested in into our topological language. So a scientist may say, I need to extract, identify, count, or measure uh, extreme points. So we could look at a persistence diagram or a persistence plot to, to start that analysis. They may be interested in local peaks or local valleys as phenomena of interest. And then we know we need to compute the leaves and branches of the join, split, or contour trees. Uh, they may be interested in ridge-like or valley-like structures, which either or which could be the saddle extremum arcs of the Morse mill complex. Uh, they may be interested in, uh, in basins or mountains, which now we know are the ascending, descending segmentation IDs of the Morse mill complex, or separating surfaces, which again, we can extract from the, the, the Morse mill complex. Um, and even this is a fantasy because no scientist is ever gonna come to you and say, I need to uh, extract or identify mountains. Instead, they're going to uh, come to you with a much more generic term of what they're interested in. Here's some examples uh, that I've encountered. So what we're gonna do is take a scientist's description of the phenomena they want to analyze and create a hypothesis uh, for, uh, in terms of the topological language for creating a robust feature definition. So for example, uh, a scientist says, I want to quantify the porosity of this metal foam on the left. Uh, this is not a topological uh, description or, or, or any kind of robust description of what they're actually looking for. Uh, so through iteration with the scientist, we can come up with a reasonable hypothesis that what they actually want to do is measure the total length and number of cycles in the ridge-like filaments uh, of the Morse mill complex of this data. Or a scientist may say, I want to measure the bubble formation rate. Well, we can translate this into our uh, topological thinking in, in terms of, for example, we have a hypothesis that you can measure this by looking at the evolution of stable descending two manifolds, or the mountains, uh, on an isosurface of mixed refraction, the height function on an isosurface uh, of mixed refraction. Or a scientist may say, I want to identify ignition kernels. So you could think of that as, well, this is local peaks of the split tree in regions of the temperature field below the flame base. Or the scientist says, I want to measure the deformation of cavity walls in my foam. Well, what we could do is say, well, we know how to separate or compute these separating surfaces between basins. Uh, we could measure the deviation from a plane for those surfaces. So, these are all hypotheses for how the features appear in, uh, but it, what it lets us do is formalize the definition uh, in terms of the topological language. Now, I would argue that these definitions are never set in stone and deriving the topological equivalent for a phenomenon of interest 
is always a continuous cycle of evaluation where the domain expert poses a problem, we can propose an abstraction and language that solves that problem. Uh, then you have to go back and use something like TTK to actually extract those features. Then a very important step is visualization and analysis. And, you know, I would argue iterating with a domain scientist and saying, well, you know, here's the features as you describe them to me in our proposed abstraction. This is what we computed. Does this solve the problem? And this is a continuous cycle that, that requires many, many layers of iteration. So let's look at some use cases. So first we'll look at a relatively straightforward application of a topological abstraction, namely extract to extract vortex structures. So a well-known approach for uh, extracting vortices is to use an indicator function like the Q criterion, but uh, also a well-known problem is that there are massive differences in the local speeds and scales of vorticity, meaning that there's no good threshold of Q that will extract vortices at these different scales. So directly applying our topological no knowledge, we can uh, theorize that what we're actually looking for is local peaks of this Q criterion. So that will apply our split tree and look at the leaves and subtrees of the split tree to create a non-uniform uh, uh, segmentation of this domain. So in particular, we define a function relevance, which basically looks at the, the local height of a subtree in our split tree and rescales the function uh, based on this local height. So what this lets us do is now create a function for which a constant threshold of relevance will extract vortex tubes at different scales. Okay, that was simple. Uh, in this next example, uh, the mapping to topological method was much more complicated. Basically, this domain scientists had this experiment where a micrometeoroid impacts a metal foam and they want to know what is the loss of porosity. So our very first uh, step was to convert this data into something that uh, topological uh, representations are good for. So the, the data came in as a binary field of one, which is metal, or zero, which is vacuum. And uh, our hypothesis was by looking at a distance function from the interface surface, the ridge lines in the morse mill complex would trace out the, uh, the center, the filamentary structure of this material, and we could look at the length and number of cycles in this filament structure. So to test this hypothesis, we generated our own uh, test data set, which is just putting material randomly along a cyan curve and a squiggle curve, a corkscrew curve, and see if we apply our distance function, compute the morse mill complex, and look at the ridge lines of this function, can we actually extract what we think we should be able to? So we did this, and here's a plot of the two saddle maximum pairs. These are the, the, the critical points that bound the ridge-like arcs. And our intuition is that uh, the high-valued saddle and maximum pairs should correspond to the center line of the structure. So now testing our hypothesis on this artificial example, we could see that indeed we traced out the expected structure. So this gave us the confidence to then apply it to the real world data. Um, so for each time step, then we computed the distance function, the morse mill complex, uh, performed persistent simplification, and uh, uh, extracted the filamentary structure, uh, identifying the total length of the filamentary structure and number of cycles to quantify the porosity. And we built a tool for the domain scientists to be able to explore basically the parameters and thresholds involved and verify visually that you know what they were extracting was actually uh, what they thought they were extracting and, and what they were measuring was, was the correct thing. Uh, and this tool, for example, was useful to identify that they had to remove kind of the, the base of the material from consideration in, in the length measurement. Another thing that the topo uh, topology let us do is define an interface service between the 
outside of the material and the voids on the inside as the ascending two manifolds from one saddles. And this, in fact, reconstructs the kind of the, the surface of the material. So you could directly measure the impact crater on this porous material. So in this example, the domain experts were interested in understanding how the walls of this foam uh, deformed. Now, our hypothesis was you could simply extract the basins from the Morse milk complex and look at the separating surfaces between the basins. One of the challenges basically became that, you know, what is actually in the data was not, was not clean. For example, this is a CT image of a metal foam and uh, there's a ton of artifacts. So it turned out that after computing the Morse milk complex and uh, providing visual feedback, there was no topological scale even at which the, the uh, basins would reliably extract the grains inside of this foam. And when we asked them, well, how do you actually extract these things uh, by quote unquote hand, even though they weren't doing it, they said, well, if you kind of squint, you kind of see the path of the, the, uh, the, the boundaries of these grains. And so what we can do is say, you know, cause the computer to squint by applying a median filter and then Gaussian blurring it uh, with a small filter radius. And what that does is now our topological segmentation aligns much better with the expected segmentation that the users had. And we can look at things like uh, the boundaries between these, these grains. Okay, so now some words of wisdom. Uh, that I've accumulated over the past two decades, which is first, I've never gotten the abstraction right on the first try. It's always iteration with the domain scientists. Uh, and uh, part of that is visualize and visualize early and often, which is you think you're computing a persistence diagram and it's telling you one thing, actually look at where those critical points are coming from. Because topology finally tells you what is in your function, not necessarily what you think there should be. So uh, there have been many cases where uh, intellectually we come up with a feature definition and when we apply it to actual data, uh, we, we come to a crashing halt because uh, what is in the data is not what we think of there should be. For instance, we've seen this with CT scans and beam hardening or uh, other kinds of artifacts. Um, and with that, I'm out of time and I'll take some questions. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, and welcome to this TTK tutorial. My name is Charles, I work at Kitware, and together we will see an introduction to Paraview. First, I will give you an history of Paraview, and then I will show you the Paraview interface. Then we'll work together as we will import data into Paraview and use some filters for a basic exploration. At the end, I will show you how to automate stuff in Paraview using scripts, and I will add some advanced manipulation that are useful in the context of TTK. Paraview is an open source software which is maintained by Kitware and which has a BSD license, which is a really permissive one. You have here some statistics about the GitLab repository. It's an end user application, which means that it's meant to be used without any code. In fact, it's used by a lot of researchers or scientists that try to explore a data set that can be really large data. It's based on VTK, which is a famous library in scientific visualization, which is both modulable and extensible. Paraview has a client-server architectures, which means it, uh, it's really scalable from the small laptop to the largest supercomputer in the world. Here is an example of a data exploration using Paraview. This example comes from the TTK website, and in the centers you have the results of our analysis with a 3D dataset and several charts. We will go further on these charts and this data uh, through this TTK tutorial. On the left, you have the pipeline view, which shows you the data you have loaded, as well as the chain of filters you have applied on this data. And below, you have a properties panel, which can be used to interact with all the properties of these filters, as well as with the properties of the different views. 
At the top, you have the main panel. It contains shortcuts for the most commonly used action. You can customize this panel as you wish. At the top left of the render view, you have several buttons for commonly used action. So you can create a screenshot. You can change the way the mouse, the mouse interact with the data and you can uh, create selection on the point or on the sale data. On the right of the view, you have some button that allow to interact the view window to split it, to maximize it or to close it. You can also change the kind of view that you want to use to choose, for example, a spreadsheet view, a chart view, and there is a lot of other kind of view in Paraview. Here we have a data set and let's say we want to change the color scheme that is used to represent the scalars on this data set. So we select the data set we want to uh, modify in the pipeline view. We go into the display properties in the properties panel and there is an edit color scheme button that can be used to get this doc on the right. As this is a really commonly used action, you also have a shortcut directly on the main panel that will also bring this doc. With this doc, you are able to change the transfer function for a volumetric rendering and also, also to change the preset of the color scheme and you can do more advanced customization if you want. Let's try to do this together. For this, we need data. To open data into Purview, we use the really common file open dialog that you can also bring with Control O. And you should have received uh, an archive with different data prior to this tutorial. So let's use the data which are inside this archive. Here is my Paraview. So file open. And I will open molecule.vti. When you open data in Paraview and when you create filters in Paraview, there is no the, the data is not rendered or the filter is not applied directly. You need to specifically apply so you can load really large data sets and create some modification, some customization of what you want to do without exploding your memory. Here, by default, we only have the outline of the data set. If we want to change this, in the property panel, you have the representation menu. And let's say, for example, that we will will choose the surface representation. The coloring may be done using the Scala fields you want. And once again, as it's a really common action, you have a shortcut directly in the main panel. So for example, we can switch here to the volume representation. If we want to edit the color scheme, we have here the edit button that brings the doc that we have seen previously. This doc can be used to change the transfer function, as you see here. You can here add a new color to create the, 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 color, the color map you want. And you can choose among the existing color maps here. So as we have seen, the parameters that concern the filters needs to be applied using the apply button. So you can uh, tune them without uh, recreating the data. And the parameters of the view are just below. Here are some examples of commonly used filters. The clip filters, which allow you to cut the data set using a plane, using a cylinder, using a box, and there is other uh, properties. The surface filter, which extracts the surface of the data set, so it will be a polydata. The threshold filters, which allows you to uh, extract all the cells between a given scalar uh, range. And the contour filters, which allows you to compute a contour at a given or several given ISO values. Some other filters that may be useful during our exploration with TTK. The tube and the spheres, which can improve greatly the representation of a graph or trees. The clean to grids, which will merge the points which are duplicates. The tetrahedralize, we, that will transform your data sets into triangles and tetrahedron, which is useful for TTK. 
the surface normal filters, which recompute the normals after you have changed the geometry, and so it improves the light, the reflection of the light in your data sets, the Python calculator, and there is a lot of other ones. So let's try some of them together. Here I have my data, so I can open a filters using the filters menu. Here, as you can see, each filters has a category. And so if I want the clip filters, I can choose common clip filters. I can interact with the widget of the view. And when, I, uh, when I'm happy, I apply this to my datasets. Using the pipeline browser here, I can choose what I want to display on my view. So let's say, for example, that, that I only want the clip. So I had I hide molecule.vti. Let's try another uh, filters. So if I want a contour, I can use the control space uh, menu, which which is a search for the filters, and I type contour. Okay. So now I have my, I have my contour filters. I want to make a contour by log row at the given value and apply. And now I have my contour inside my data sets. I can hide molecule again so we see it. Now the automation parts. Once you have created a large pipeline, you may want of course to save the results of this pipeline, but maybe the pipeline itself. So you can share this pipeline with people or you can re-execute this pipeline later. This can be done using Paraview state files. There is two kinds of Paraview state files. PVSM, which are meant to be shared, as when you apply a PVSM state file, Paraview will uh, ask you to pick up the file on which you want to apply the pipeline. So even if you have different path uh, than the people that give you the state file, it will work uh, like a charm. And you have the Python's uh, state file, which can be used, of course, in Paraview, but can also be used in PVPythons, which is the Paraview version of Pythons that does not bring the interface. And so this is really useful for batch processing. Paraview will also let you save screenshots of the data you have displayed on screen. So for example, here, I can save a screenshot of my contour by using file, save screenshots. Let's say I want my screenshot to be named test.png. Here I have some parameters I can tune, and OK. And now I have a test.png file with this uh, image on it that will contain only the, con the content of my main view. Par we, can act, uh, we can interact with Paraview using Pythons. And one way to do it is using the Python shell. So let's zoom on this uh, Python shell view Python shell. Let's close this as we do not need it anymore. OK. And now I can type Python's command, like uh, get active view, for example. OK. And M is now a Paraview server manager object. And I can create filters, change parameters of my filters, and so forth. The best way to learn how, uh, we, how to do something in Python's in Paraview and what you can do with Python's inside Paraview is to let Paraview do it uh, by itself. So you can learn uh, what methods correspond to what action. For this, you can use the start trace option, the, uh, the start trace tool, sorry. So let's try it. Tools, start trace. Let's say we want to show the incremental trace, okay? And now, when I uh, do any action, I will have them saved here in uh, in a file, okay? And here, if we, if we have a look, we can see I have shown well what is in the first layout, and I have hide what is in the second one. Stop tries. And here we have the final results.
Now, let's see some advanced manipulation. So, we can create some uh, advanced selection. So, on the left, we have seen uh, there is some basic selection that you can create with the mouse. And here on the right, we see the interface meant to create more advanced selection. Edit, find data. So, let's do this. Edit, find data. I want to create to find points, for example, in the molecule.vta uh, entry. And I want those with an ID which will be greater than 100. And that will be lower than 200, for example. OK? And here are the corresponding IDs on my data. Preview can also be used to create animations. So here we have a data set with a contour. Let's try to animate the contour. So we can see it, the contour move uh, through time. So for this we need the animation view. And we want the value which is used for the contour to vary through time. So we add this entry that will change the isosurface through time. And we want this value to change from the minimum one to the maximum one in the scalar range. OK. And now, if I press play, I will see the contour evolving through time. Uh, I need to show, of course, the contour for that. It's a bit fast here, so let's try to slow down things a bit. And here we see our animation. Then, to finish, Paraview can be extended using plugin, and TTK is one of them. So let's see how we can load a plugin into Paraview, or check that a plugin is already loaded into Paraview. For this, you have the Tools Manage Plugin window. So, Tools. Manage plugin. And if TTK is correctly installed on your computer, you should have here an entry, topology toolkit, which should be loaded. If it's not loaded by default, you can use the auto load entry. Here is, here is the end of this presentation. This work has been uh, supported by the Vestex project and uh, Good continuation in this TTK tutorial. Attention mechanisms have greatly improved the performance of many language models, yet with great power comes increased complexity. In this work, we present attention flows, a visualization that let users interpret the language model's decisions and gain insights into the underlying self-attention mechanism. We also support model comparison that helps to fill the gaps between models in different training stages. As data is changing, our understanding of data should be updated correspondingly. Based on machine learning approaches, we formulate a drift level index to monitor the evolution of multi-source data, which allows users to capture and reason significant changes from time series data. The proposed visual analytics system is called Concept Explorer. More details can be found in our talk. White space surfaces are a novel approach to convey depth in vessel visualizations. The core idea is to shift all additional depth cues away from geometry and to use the usually empty space between the vascular structures. This allows us to display functional parameters on the surface and supporting cues on the background. We will explain how to generate such surfaces and how to use them as a canvas to further enhance depth and shape perception. We have seen many visualizations for tree data structures, but when showing changes in trees over time, some focus on displaying hierarchy while others highlight their changes. 
With split streams, we combine two approaches and the individual benefits. We evaluated our method in a user study and considered it a general purpose method for the visualization of dynamic hierarchies. Our JavaScript library is openly available. Several recent studies advocated the use of non-parametric density models for the improved characterization of data uncertainty. The non-parametric models, however, present the challenges such as increased memory and computational requirements. In this work, we propose an efficient non-parametric framework for volume rendering in the context of uncertain data and show their effectiveness in classifications via comparisons with the other statistical models. In our paper, we address the problem of navigating complex multiscale and dense environments, such as these molecular models. We present a technique for browsing a model by clicking on textual labels, which we call hyperlabels. This allows the user to intuitively navigate the hierarchical organization of the model. For more details, read our paper or watch the talk. We propose an interactive ensemble analysis framework that provides flexible interactive exploration of the ensemble data. Time series characteristics of data can be obtained by fast browsing time steps. The region stability heat map view shows the stability of the selected region and provides region adjustment by directly clicking.
deep neural networks are vulnerable to maliciously generated adversarial examples. This brings high risk in applying these networks to safety critical applications. We develop a visual analytics approach to explain the root cause of such wrong predictions. Our contribution contains a constrained path extraction method, a river based visualization, and a contribution analysis method. Serum graphs are variant of stack graphs with curve baseline, and the main factor affecting its reliability is the sign allurance through a perceptual inconsistency of the orthogonal and vertical direction. Aiming at reducing its impacts, we revisited the baseline formulation and proposed the concept of composition to help the serum graph layout optimization. The result shows that our algorithms perform better than the others. We propose a new semi-automatic method that uses topological features to guide users in tracing neurons and integrate this method within a virtual reality framework. We use the Morse smell complex to find a set of candidate neuron arcs. The candidate arcs are integrated into a VR neuron tracing system and exposed through our Morse smell complex guided semi-automatic tracing tool. The topological ridge graph underlying our MSC guided tool is robust against gaps in the signal. We asked participants to recreate bar graphs. When the bar was alone, we saw a different pattern of error than when the bar was presented with context in a stacked bar graph. We find that absolute error increased for higher bars when they were presented alone. We also found that there was a bias in the responses such that they were repulsed from an implicit 50% mark. We found a magic number, 10%, to predict error. Participants are usually within 10% of the height of the bar. Spot SDC is a visualization system that helps researchers understand the resiliency of HPC computation kernels to silent error corruptions. It gives users multiple perspectives of details with different granularity about the impact of SDC on an application's output. It also provides novel insight into how silent error propagates through a program's execution. We present strat graphics, an approach for designing data agnostic and fully reusable visualization templates. Strat graphics follows the inverse workflow that common data driven systems. Rather than starting from data, designers construct visualization structures without relying on a data schema. Data tables are shaped later from the structure of graphics. We demonstrate the power of the approach through a gallery of visualization examples. How do you visualize the nanoscale, one billionth of a meter for the public? As part of a science center exhibition, we developed an immersive environment that explains nano concepts by allowing users to explore nano properties. We reflect on how exploration, the confluence of explanatory and exploratory visualization, can be applied to visualization in public spaces. Imagine you have tons of text data to analyze. And you want to get an overview of your data, but traditional topping modeling techniques such as LDA are not working for you. Then, why don't you try Architext? We introduce a scalable and flexible way to interactively build hierarchical topics. In our current work, we visually compare two cohorts of segmented and classified tissue images originated from single-cell omics data. To that end, we developed data-driven and interactive workflow implemented in a multi-linked view system. Finally, we show the effectiveness of our workflow through specific case studies. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter 
so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. With the proliferation of AutoML systems, it's now easier than ever for known experts to create and deploy end to end machine learning pipelines. These systems explore the model search space and optimize hyperparameters in order to solve a particular task. We propose Pipeline Profiler, a tool that enables the exploration and comparison of machine learning pipelines produced by multiple AutoML systems. By analyzing these pipelines, we have the opportunity to better understand how AutoML systems work and obtain insights that can be used to improve them. Text alignment is a fundamental technique in many text-related domains. In this survey, we cover three text alignment scenarios, collision task, text reuse detection, and transition alignment. On the basis of those scenarios, we reviewed the existing text alignment visualization approaches and discussed their advantages and drawbacks. We finally derived design implications and shed light on related future challenges. Program developers spend significant time on optimizing and tuning applications. But working with binary code to understand what compiler optimizations were applied can be challenging. We present our visual analytics system, CCNAP, designed to identify and assess compiler optimizations in binary code. Check out our paper to learn more. Serializing class separations is used in applications such as classification and clustering. However, many dimension reduction techniques are limited due to the issues of separability and interpretability. We propose a visual analytics framework to support the exploration of nonlinear complex separation structures with the power of locally linear separations. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. When developing a deep learning model, people typically struggle to optimize hyperparameters that are affecting the model performance. To relieve the pain of this manual trial process, AutoML has been developed as a solution. However, to maximize the potential of the AutoML, people should identify a good AutoML setting for their task. HyperTender helps to maximize the potential by visualizing AutoML algorithm behavior and guiding effective hyperparameters. We present NL4DV, a toolkit that helps prototype natural language interfaces for data visualizations. NL4DV provides a high-level Python API for interpreting natural language queries. 
the API automates the core tasks of processing natural language queries to infer relevant information and determine appropriate visualizations, allowing visualization developers to focus more on designing and implementing the user interface. We present Lyra 2, a system for designing interactive visualizations by demonstration. To design interactions in Lyra 2, users directly manipulate the visualization canvas. The system interprets demonstrations using heuristics and suggests possible interaction designs. We find that Lyra 2 enables rapid prototyping of an expressive range of interaction designs. We're excited to share this work with you. Linking and brushing is very well useful for interactive visual data exploration. Data-driven brushing tools are getting popular recently and achieve good results, for example, the Mahanoda based brush and the CN based brush. However, these brushing tools are optimized by the data from a large number of users, which are not suitable for everyone. In this paper, we introduce an adaptive brush model which takes the user in a loop to improve the brush accuracy. VisaVis -vis is a visual support system for the development of visualization algorithms. It has live compilation, automatic version control, predefined interactions, and tools for visual parameter analysis. By displaying the complete history of the algorithm, users get insights into the correlation between source code changes and visual differences. We present the first generic design space and library for visual piling. Inspired by physically piling paper documents, visual piling describes an interface for spatial organization of visual artifacts into piles of partially overlapping items. Piling affords interactive grouping, arrangement, previewing, browsing, and aggregation to reduce the complexity and support comparison of large collections of small multiples. This is a picture of a Tableau visualization within the browser. The data behind the visualization does not exist here, and Tableau is not running. This is just an image. However, parts of this image are fully interactive. Please join our presentation to see how we can share interactive visualizations across the web, free from any dependency on data or visualization application. If machine learning were like education, we would like to test what concepts our student, the model, has learned. Has it learned the concept of object rotation? Does additional text help with object recognition? We need a methodology and platform for conducting such tests. In this paper, we present a novel visual analytics tool that enables hypothesis-based evaluation of machine learned models.
Data videos are quite popular nowadays. They usually show changes in the data. However, creating a data video requires multiple skills, and the process is usually laborious and iterative. Our approach focuses on automatic and interactive visual enhancement of important changes in time series. I will now present some uh, guidelines regarding the general usage of TTK. For this, I will use this uh, standard example, which is the toy example that is described in TTK's companion paper. So what you see here is a screenshot of Paraview. And here, uh, you recognize the uh, pipeline browser that was introduced before, and basically describes the sequences of processings that the input data goes through. In particular, in this example, the input data is a simple 2D terrain, which is a bit noisy. So to cope with the additive noise present in the data, the persistence curve co uh, shown in the top right corner here has been computed to isolate a threshold which separates noise from features. And what this curve says is that there's a flat plateau uh, right here in the number of features for a localized interval of persistence threshold. And this means that if you simplify the input data with this, within this interval, you will not lose many features. So it's a sort of stationary state, which typically separates noise from features. From this point on, what is shown in this example is a very standard procedure that is used in the vast majority of the TTK use cases. So first, the persistence diagram is computed uh, here at the bottom right, to select the most persistent features, the most important ones. And then the data is pre-simplified such that only the persistent features remain. And after this point, any topological analysis can be carried out. And in this example, the Morse med complex of the data is computed, and we see the critical points with spheres, uh, the separatrices with cylinders, and the segmentation of the data into the descending manifolds. So far, this example has been presented in PowerView, but TTK can be accessed and used outside of PowerView, and I will further uh, describe this now. So each module in TTK is available as a filter in PowerView. And here, each filter is shown with a little green box in the pipeline browser here. So you can apply uh, each TTK module to some data set in the PowerView user interface uh, thanks to this filter notion. But each TTK module is also available as standalone programs, such that it is possible to replicate everything which is done in part view with simple standalone programs. So initially, each filter was associated with two standalone programs, 
a minimal VTK-based graphical user interface uh, that you see here, and a uh, command line program. But the graphical user interface is going to be marked as deprecated since uh, we found that this was not very used by the TTK users. Um, the standalone command line programs, on the other hand, are fairly useful for batch processing or benchmarking. And here you have a screenshot of the screen output of a command line program uh, down there. In addition to the Parview plugins and the standalone programs, TTK is available as an API for developers. And we actually provide four different APIs. We first provide a Parview-based Python API called PVPython. This is a plain Python API that implements the TTK features which are accessible within Parview. So this is by far the simplest API, and it really mimics the content of the pipeline browser. So in particular, to reproduce the data processing pipeline shown in the Parview interface um, here, which consists in computing the persistence diagram, pre-simplifying the data, and computing the Morseman complex, well, all of this pipeline can be done in about 20 lines of, uh, of Python. And an interesting aspect of the PVPython API is that such uh, code snippets can be generated automatically by Paraview, as I uh, probably mentioned before. For instance, if you design a uh, data processing uh, pipeline in Paraview and you are happy with it, uh, well, you can export it automatically as a Python script, uh, which will follow this API. So this API, as I said before, is arguably the simplest to use. It targets end users who want to batch process uh, their data in a convenient and simple way. Since last year, we also provide a VTK-based Python API, which is for more advanced users and Python developers. Uh, in particular, uh, this API provides more advanced functionalities to fully interact with the internals of each DTK module, and not only, not only the output it exposes in Paraview. So this API targets Python developers who are interested in using TTK, but Lutz is going to provide more details about this. So for more advanced developers, in particular uh, those who use C++, TTK is available uh, with a VTK-based C++ API, which exactly coincides with the VTK-based Python API. So to reproduce the processing of the toy example with this API, you'll need about 40 lines of code. This API is the one that we recommend to use for C++ developers, especially for those uh, developers who are already familiar with VTK. For those, uh, this API will feel extremely familiar and natural. We recommend to use this API also if you are not familiar with VTK, as it is very uh, convenient to use in terms of memory management and IO handling and consistency and all. So for instance, a couple of years back, Will Usher and Kiwu wrote a uh, topology-driven volume renderer called TopoVol, which used this uh, API. So if you do not wish to use VTK, we also offer a uh, last C++ API that directly exposes the internal features of TTK in a way that is completely independent from VTK. So this is pretty much an API for these developers who want to pull a minimal amount of third-party dependencies, in particular, who do not wish to pull the VTK dependency. So here, to reproduce the processing of our toy example, you will need about 100 lines of code. This is by far the most verbose API because there is a lot of low-level things uh, that VTK used to take care of and that you now have to take care of yourself, uh, such as I.O., memory management, and allocation, and so on. And for instance, as uh, Martin will show, uh, InVivo is using this API of TTK. All right, now we'll move on to the basic usage guidelines for PowerView. So under the PowerView user interface, most TTK features are available as filters, which are basic data processing units. And in particular, the TTK filters are arranged in some menus appearing at the bottom uh, of the list uh, right here. For bivariate data, we provide features to compute continuous CADA plots, fibers and fiber surfaces, Jacobi sets and rib spaces. And here I refer you to the website for uh, usage examples. TTK also provides an advanced part of view cinema support for the handling of databases of uh, data processing artifacts. This is typically useful if you consider, for instance, large collections of data sets and you apply some topological analysis for each data set. 
if you want to store and manipulate in a convenient way the database of topological outputs, you want to use our cinema features. We also provide a few features for dimensionality reduction. In particular, we integrate scikit-learn to support state-of-the-art dimensionality reduction techniques. This is particularly useful for, to handle high-dimensional data sets and project them down uh, in the dimensions, typically 2D and 3D, where TTK is currently able to, to operate. We have a long list of filters in the MISC category, and these are mostly convenience features that we found to be useful when developing the core topological features of TTK. We provide a uh, substantial amount of features for scalar data, including merge trees, counter trees, marshmallow complexes, persistence curves and diagrams, critical points, rip graphs, fast distances and barrier centers for persistence diagrams. And note here uh, the presence of the topological simplification filter, uh, which, as I said before, is pretty central to uh, uh, most TTK use cases. We also provide features for time varying data sets, including critical point tracking and nested tracking graphs. And for uncertain data, we have a couple of features, including mandatory critical points. Importantly, for each filter, you have an online help page, which is available. Uh, to access it, simply click on the question mark uh, button here. Um, and this will open the help page uh, to the right. This page should explain in details what inputs are expected, what are the parameters, and how to interpret the output. We provide also a data package uh, that contains all the data sets in Harvey state files uh, for the examples shown on the website. So it's a great entry point to TTK because with this you can replicate everything that is available on the website and understand how the different pipelines were put together. We also have a number of video tutorials that explain on a step-by-step -step basis how to replicate the examples from the website. And Lutz will further discuss this, but TTK support in Python is fairly easy to use thanks to an Anaconda package. So as mentioned before, TTK is available with the Python API. Uh, you'll find the uh, code for the toy example processing in the source tree of TTK under the examples uh, subdirectory and the Python code will be under the examples Python subdirectory. But in short, you have a block of code uh, to compute the persistence diagram here uh, for uh, threshold, thresholding it, uh, simplifying the data, and computing the Morse -Mac complex. You have the same example uh, for the pvpython API under the examples pvpython directory, uh, in VTK C++ under examples VTK C++, and for the C++ in example under example C++. So again, if you are a developer and you want to use TTK, we recommend that you take a look at these examples. Also, there is a companion Doxygen documentation for TTK, which resembles in this form the VTK documentation. We refer you to the website where you find a lot of additional documentation material and links to uh, user mailing lists. All right, so now that you have a sense of how to use TTK, in particular in PowerView, We'll proceed to uh, hands-on sessions where we'll show how to use TTK features in PowerView for concrete uh, data analysis tasks. And this includes data segmentation, filament extraction, or topology comparison. Hello, I'm Christoph Gart with the University of Kaiserslautern. In the following, I will tell you about a quick and easy way to get started with using TTK and experimenting with it using a virtualization technology called Docker. For those of you that have not heard about Docker or haven't had a chance to employ it, let me give you a very brief rundown. In brief, Docker is a virtualization technology, not unlike virtual machines, that facilitates the creation of well-defined software environments. A typical use case is to package an application with all its dependencies, that is, libraries that it needs to run, and potentially other resources such as data files. In Dockerland, all of this is packaged into a so-called container, which can be used on any machine that has the Docker tools installed. The advantage of using containers over other means of packaging, such as a systems package manager, address one of the most difficult challenges of working with scientific software, which is getting it installed in the first place. The runtime environment in a container is, well, self-contained, so there are no conflicting library versions, no need to recompile on unrelated system updates, no platform-specific problems such as, for example, the difference between Ubuntu and CentOS, etc. I could go on for a while. The list of potential problems when using scientific software from source is very long. If you have compiled Paraview before, you know what I'm talking about. So containers in many cases solve these problems, and we can make use of this by packaging TTK and its dependencies, most notably Paraview, into containers.
This completely eschews any need for manual installation or compilation and any dependency problems or long compiles. If you have worked with virtual machines before, this may all sound quite familiar. VMs package an entire machine environment and implicitly also all applications and dependencies installed on the machine. A Docker container, however, does not package an entire machine, and so it can be much more lightweight. For example, the TTK virtual machine provided for this tutorial weighs in at more than 10 gigabytes, whereas the Docker image packaging the same software is about 1.4 gigabytes in size. Furthermore, the light virtualization that Docker provides is also reflected in the startup time. A virtual machine has to be booted, the operating system has to be started, and so on. Whereas a Docker container is basically a process on the host machine, and so it can start very quickly. Before we move on, let me take note of the terminology around Docker. In Docker parlance, a container is a running process with some application inside. Containers are initialized from so-called images, uh, which are essentially snapshots of containers. And finally, the Docker engine is the piece of software that you need to install on your machine. It is the tool that is responsible for running and executing containers. So if you want to use TTK with Docker, you need to install the Docker tools. This is actually easy to do. Uh, while Docker isn't open source software, it is free to install and use. Um, so as long as you have installation privileges on your machine, you can follow this approach. Here at the bottom, I'm providing links to installation instructions for some of the most often used operating systems. And typically, this amounts to running an installer or installing a package through the package manager. So this is quite easy to do. OK, so let's see how we can leverage Docker to easily experiment with TTK. We will do this using containers that contain both Paraview as well as the TTK plugins for Paraview. Paraview can, by design, operate in a client-server mode. This means that the server, where all of the data resides and computation is executed, may run on a different machine than the client, which is basically the GUI. In other words, we can run the Paraview GUI to control the server running on a different machine. Originally, this is intended to facilitate visualization in supercomputing, where the GUI typically runs on a local desktop, but the server may reside on a supercomputer or cluster of some kind. However, we can hijack this mechanism and utilize the client-server nature of Paraview to work with Docker containers. While the Paraview GUI, the client, will run as a native application on the host desktop, we can stick the Paraview server into a Docker container, where it is installed, including the TTK plugins. The local GUI and the server in the container can talk to each other through a Docker facility called host container networking. In this scenario, we don't have to do any compilation. For the client, we can simply use an off-the-shelf stock Paraview binary available from Kitware's website for all major platforms. For the server, we use a Docker image that has Paraview with the TTK plugins. It doesn't matter that the client, the GUI, does not have the TTK plugins. We will still be able to use the server's TTK plugins due to some magic that Paraview is working behind the scenes. By far the simplest way to get all of this up and running is to download Docker, a Paraview version from Kitware's website, and to install it both on your machine, and then open a terminal and run the convenience script provided in the TTK repository. This will automatically detect the Paraview version you have installed and run a matching server in a Docker container. Also, this will make available to the server your home directory, such that you can access data from there in the server. For more complex setups, for example, if you have multiple Paraview versions installed, you can optionally supply the path to one of them. Once the container has started up all right, the client GUI will be launched on the desktop and automatically connect to the server. The script doesn't do anything too fancy, and in fact, it simply invokes the Docker command to start a container. You could also do this manually for a little more control of what specific versions of Paraview and TTK you want to utilize, or to make other data directories available to the server. Just to give you an idea, I'm showing you here the Docker command needed to run a Paraview 5.8.1 server with the TTK plugins from the developer series. Docker run tells Docker to run a container, and the final argument, here highlighted in brown, is the name of the image used to initialize the container. The other arguments here take care of making sure the container is temporary, allowing it to see Paraview output, and providing access to the home directory without problems. So let me show you how easy this can actually be in practice. Here I am on my local Mac desktop. And here in the terminal, I've already prepared uh, the command to run the Paraview server Docker container with the TTK plugins. Uh, I'm going to show you the manual process. So let's run this. Um, the image isn't found locally, so Docker will automatically download it, which may take a while. And now that the image is downloaded, it's automatically started up, uh, and we can see the output from the Paraview server, which is accepting BCP connections. So let's fire up the Paraview GUI. Uh, and here we are. It's uh, just uh, the Paraview GUI as usual. 
Um, there is no sign of any TTK plugins or anything, but once we connect uh, through this icon here to the server on the local machine, uh, we can simply click connect here. And then Paraview will show us this little window where it tells us that it has found plugins on the server side, namely topology toolkit, that are not present on the, on the client side, that we're connected to the right container. And as we can see now, the, uh, the TTK plugins are uh, accessible. So for example, we can use the Icosphere source uh, to produce this beautiful Icosphere. Um, let's try to load a state file um, to see whether all the computations run on the server. I've conveniently already downloaded the TTK uh, data repository and there are some state files in there. Let's use uh, the dragon here. And uh, the only thing we need to do is to tell uh, the Paraview server that it can find um, the data files in a specific location. And note how this is still the path to my home directory, just as I would use it in a local machine. So let's hit OK here and wait for the state to be loaded. Uh, all the computations are re-executed and here we get uh, the dragon uh, just as if we would run it on a local machine. Let me note a couple of things before coming to an end. First, it is entirely possible to go beyond host container networking to connect the Paraview client and the server and have an arbitrary internet connection in between them. This means that the Docker image can be run remotely, maybe on a more powerful machine, as long as the TCP connection from the client to the server is possible. This means that you can quickly try out things with TTK on your local machine and then run on a larger data on a bigger machine, all while controlling things from your local GUI and using the exact same software version and runtime environment. The downside is that in order to run the server container on any machine, you need super user privileges to access Docker. This does complicate matters a bit, especially in supercomputing environments where root access is not commonly available. Let me, however, point out that in these cases, Singularity can serve as a stand-in for Docker. Uh, it is a tool that is especially aimed at such environments. And the good news is that you can use TTK Docker containers directly with Singularity. I don't have time to go into this here, but if this is your use case, I strongly encourage you to check this out. Secondly, all of the scripts needed to build the TTK and Paraview Docker container are part of the TTK repository. So do feel free to customize and build your own containers as you see fit. Your mileage may vary when combining versions of TTK and Paraview, but installing any extra software, etc. are easily done. Check out the Docker documentation to learn more. Currently, we are providing the following uh, containers uh, available from uh, Docker Hub. These are the combinations of Paraview and TTK that build cleanly together. So, to conclude, let me summarize the message I've tried to convey here. Trying out TTK or getting started with topological analysis for visualization requires nothing beyond an internet connection and a couple of minutes to download Docker, Paraview, and a matching TTK container. No compiles are required on your machine. In fact, it isn't even necessary to have a compiler installed on the machine you are working on. Plus, there are some extra benefits of working in this mode, such as network transparency and the Python interface, a typically negligible overhead. If you're interested uh, in how things work behind the scenes, or even better, if you want to help improve the TTK Docker experience, let me point you to the TTK repository on GitHub. Contributions there are always welcome. With this, I'm done. Please enjoy the remainder of the tutorial. Christoph out. Hello, everyone. Hello again, and thanks to be part of this TTK tutorial. Now, we will see how we can segment medical data using merge trees. First, I will give you some context by explaining what are the data we are manipulating and what we want to do with them. We want to extract some prominent features in the dataset, and for this, a usual pipeline with TTK is to simplify the dataset so we keep only the numbers of features that we want, and then we compute a merge tree to get the area corresponding of these uh, features and we have a look at the segmentation of these trees to visualize this area. The data set we are manipulating is a scan of a human foot on which on each point the scalar value is the density of matters in this position. A point with a low scalar value can correspond to the air around the, fo the foot and the point with the highest scalar values will correspond to the bones inside the foot. Let's open this data set. We are only interested in the scalar field name scalars and apply. 
if we want to have the same view as in the slide, we can use the volume representation. So now we want to extract the area corresponding to the bones of the foot and if possible we'll try to identify each toe. For this we need to extract area attached to the maximum values of scalar fields as bones are the area with a really high density of matter. We can use a merge tree for that. But if we compute a merge tree directly on the data set, we have a lot of noise. So for, to, to reduce this noise, we will keep a data set with only five maxima. We will simplify this data set using a topological simplification. And then we will compute the split tree on it. Let's do together this topological simplification. We want to keep the area attached to the five most persistent maximum, persistent maximum. Let's compute a persistence diagram to see how many features we have on the data sets. We can use the default properties here. Here is the persistence diagram that we obtain with a lot of pearls. We want to keep only the five most persistent pairs. For this, we will filter our persistence diagram using a threshold. But which is what is the value that we want to keep only five pairs? We can have this information using the persistence, uh, the persistence curve. Here is the persistence curve on the foot.vti, which shows you for each persistence value how many pairs are in the persistence diagram. And we can see in this, in this curve that to keep only five pairs, we need a threshold of 187. Let's try this. I want a threshold on the persistence diagram using the persistence and I want to remove all the pairs below 187. Here is the result. If I look in the information, I have six cells and I want only five. This is because I also have the diagonal, which is a bit uh, a virtual pair. So I want to remove this diagonal and that can also be done using a threshold on the result of my first threshold. And the diagonal is a specific pair with the identifiers minus one. So let's remove the pair with the identifiers minus one. And I obtain my persistence diagram with five pair. Now we have all the information we need for the topological simplification. Topological simplification is the TTK filters that will operate on two input the domain, which is the foot, and the constraint, which is the resulting persistence diagram that we have just computed. So let's call the topological simplification. The domain on which we want to, oper to operate this simplification is foot.vti, and the constraints are the threshold we have just computed. Properties. Here, we can use the default values. Now, I have a new version of the foot. We don't see any difference, but the noise has been removed, and that we will see by computing a merge tree. We have said that we want the merge tree at, with leaves corresponding to maxima, so this is the split tree. In TTK, the filters that you can use to compute contour trees on merge trees is named FTM. In the properties, we select a split tree and we can compute it. As we can see, the result is a tree with only five leaves and one root. Now, let's extract the area corresponding 
of the leaves. For this, we need to attach to get the region which are attached to the leaf, and this region have a region type of one. Once again, we will use a threshold to get the, them. So on the segmentation output of the FTM tree, we want a threshold using the region type with a value of sorry, one, apply. And here we have our results. Thank you to have followed this presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Pierre Guillou. I work on the TTK library with Julien Tierney at Sorbonne University. Today, I will show you how to extract filament structures with the Morse smell complex using TTK. At the end of this tutorial, you should be able to use Paraview and TTK to extract the Morse smell complex of any given dataset. Morse smell complex provides information about critical points represented by spheres in this screenshot and separate addresses that link together those critical points and constitute a segmentation of the input dataset. For this tutorial, I will first present some elements of context and show how to extract features of interest, elements, and the Morse mail segmentation using Paraview and TDK. And first, some bits of context. Astrophysicists use dark matter density simulations to better understand the structure of our universe, and particularly how galaxies cluster themselves. Dark matter filaments between galaxy clusters are called the cosmic webs, and those filaments can be extracted using the Morse mail complex. In the chemistry field, researchers use the simulate the electronic probability density of a molecule from the position of its atoms in space. Here you can see a simulation of the A and T bases from the DNA and how they pair themselves. Chemists are especially interested in locating the covalent and the hydrogen bonds between atoms and measuring the steric repulsion effect inside the molecular cycles. In the following, we will focus on a dataset that simulates this particular molecule. I will show you how to use the Morse mail complex separatrices to extract the filament structure. Let's hop into the Paraview window. We will open uh, the input dataset file, which is named at.vti, and load it. Uh, this uh, dataset has uh, one scalar field, which is named density. And in fact, it's the opposite of the logarithm of the electronic probability density, meaning that atoms, which have the highest electronic density, uh, are the minima of this particular field. You can try to understand uh, this uh, scalar field using the surface or the volume representations, but it's quite hard to make something of it. So let's go back to the outline representation and we will use the contour filter to generate isosurfaces. And one particular isosurface of interest is the one with the value minus one. And we'll reduce the opacity of it. So at first, we will extract the features of interest. And for that, we will use Paraview to apply the Morse mail complex filter onto the input dataset AT.VTI. In a first step, we'll uncheck every box except the critical points one. And afterwards, we will display the critical points using the TTK spare from point filter applied on the critical points output. Let's do that. I select the AT.VTI filter, apply the, apply the Morse mail complex filter, while unchecking every box except the critical points, making sure that the density scalar field is the one selected here. And after two seconds about uh, uh, on my laptop, 
the computation has ended and you can apply the sphere from point filter onto the critical point output. I will uh, increase the radius of these spheres and color them by cell dimension. Here you can see three kinds of critical points. In blue, we have the minima. In white, we have the uh, one saddles that are located uh, between uh, two minima. And in red, we have the two saddles that represent the holes into the uh, scalar field. And in fact, those uh, critical points represent the atomic structure of the dataset. Minima are atoms. One saddles are the midpoint or the barycenter of the atomic bonds, either the covalent bonds inside the uh, isosurfaces or the hydrogen bonds outside of it. And two saddles represent the barycenter of the steric repulsion effect caused by those molecular cycles. And to extract filaments, we will check the descending one separatrices and the saddle connectors boxes into the property panels, the properties panel of the Morse mail complex filter. And then we will use the geometry smoother filter to clean the output of the one separatrices output. Let's go back to the Morse mail complex filter. We will check those boxes. We'll run it again. We'll select the one separatist output and smooth the curves with 100 iterations. And for a, an improved display, I will use the extract surface and the tube uh, filters to better see what we have. We'll color them by separatrix type. As you can see, we have two kinds of separatrices here. In red, we have what we call the saddle connectors that uh, link together a two, uh, two saddle and all the surrounding one saddles on a, from the same cycle. Here, 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 and here. Here and in blue, we have what we call the descending one separatrices that uh, descends from the one saddles to the sounding minima. And in fact, uh, those uh, descending one separatrices provide a skeleton of this dataset. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, those uh, descending one separatrices can also be interpreted as the representation of the atomic bonds, either the covalent or the hydrogen bonds between atoms. And uh, last, we will compute a segmentation of the dataset. So we will check the ascending two separatrices box and uh, we will uh, clean it. We will clean the output using a uh, conjunction of the tetrahedralized filter and the geometry smoother filter applied on the two separatrices output of the Morse complex. Let's do that. I will select the corresponding box. I will, uh, the surface has been generated. I will tetrahedralize them then using, using the geometry smoother filter to smooth the surfaces. This might take a while, two seconds in my laptop. And I will color them by separatrix ID. So, as you can see, those surfaces represent uh, the uh, borders between the area of influence of each minima. In fact, the every one saddle between two minima is contained in, in such surface, in one of these surfaces. And those surfaces provide also a segmentation of the input dataset. And uh, they can be, those surfaces can also be interpreted as the um, area of influence of each atom.
at the border of the area of, effect, of influence of every atom in this molecule. So this concludes this tutorial. We have used Paraview and TTK to extract critical points and separatrices of this chemistry dataset. And we got a skeleton and a segmentation of this molecule. Part of this work has been funded by the European Commission through the Vestec project. So thank you for your attention and have a nice VIS 2020 conference. Bye. Hello and welcome to this part of the VIS 2020 TTK tutorial. The topic of this presentation is extracting contours associated with critical points. I'm Christopher Kappel from the Technical University of Kaiserslautern. My agenda is as follows. First, I'm going to briefly introduce the application domain of the examples you're going to see. Then I'm going to talk about critical points and their role as feature cause, um, leading to contours that extend these critical points to intuitive feature regions. Generally, there will be few slides and a much more live demonstration. So, um, this technique is applicable to any scalar variable defined on a surface in 2D or 3D on any type of mesh. Here you are going to see a um, temperature anomaly on a global scale, which was the output of a climate simulation. Given in degrees Celsius, for example, in this left image, you see a state of the world where everything is a little bit colder than usual, while on the right, um, you um, everything seems to be a little bit hotter. What we want to get is um, we want to be able to extract a few really significant features of scalar fields um, in order to be able to focus on the important stuff while not missing anything important. Um, especially if you want to compare two or more scalar fields, um, this is really a, a helpful simplification. So what we first imagined before we implemented this um, would be something like this, just to be able to highlight regions with extraordinary low or high temperature, um, just as you would do with these hand-drawn pink shapes. And now um, it is possible to compute um, such shapes automatically with TTK in Paraview. Um, the key idea behind this is the observation that um, at the center of uh, each such feature there is a local minimum or maximum. Um, and these can be computed with TTK. To get such a nice uh, number of around 10 or 20 um, critical points, Typically, you have to apply a topological simplification first, which you may have already heard about, um, um, because um, usually because of the net uh, noisy noisy nature of real-world datasets, there are going to be much more local extrema, um, but um, these can be filtered out based on their persistence, which basically means how much they are. Um, a local minimum or maximum is set apart from its immediate environment. So let's just reproduce this in PowerView. I've already loaded the data here and as you may know um, you need the persistence diagram for the um, critical points and their filtering. So I like to view them embedded in the domain which at first gives you a lot of um, pairs of these critical points. And so we directly apply a threshold filter um, where you can filter based on the persistence um, your critical points. So you don't want to throw away anything on the upper end, um, but only the minimum is important. Um, this value depends on your application um, by the way, you typically want to keep your original data in the back. And here something um, like 0 0.4 that turns out to be a good value. This dramatically simplifies the number of critical points. You can also visualize them, for example, with um, Gaussian points and color them by their critical type. So based on this, you can compute the simplification. Um, 
takes as constraints this threshold. And it should still look very much like the original data. Yes, and you may keep the extreme points in view. So, um, with these critical points, um, you can go on and extend these points to regions um, defined by contours, ISO contours to be precise, um, which are defined by the fact that the scalar field below them um, has the same ISO value. And now what you need to define is which what ISO value this is supposed to be. Um, Eventually, this will control the size of your um, regions. So you can imagine if the ISO value was the value that is at the respective extreme point, um, the size will basically be zero, and the other side of the spectrum basically would be maximum um, extended regions which touch each other um, and should not go further because overlap would be very confusing. Um, and this can be achieved by utilizing the information in the contour tree, um, where these extreme points are typically um, connected via a saddle point, um, and the scalar value at the saddle point would be this um, maximum extension. And so this gives a range of between 0 and 100% um, that you can set as a parameter in Paraview to actually um, specify the size of your regions. So let's do this. Um, so contour tree. Um, we don't actually look at the tree itself. But um, we will use it uh, in the filter that is called contour around points that takes, um, besides the actual scalar field, the nodes and arcs of a contour tree. Um, as I've mentioned, here is this extension parameter. Um, we can just try it out first. Um, typically you want to uh, set the line width a little bit higher or even use um, tubes if you want to in a 3D context. Oops. Um, and to get this originally hand-drawn graphic, you may want to change the color for a good contrast. So, um, just for demonstration purposes, if you set this extension to something very cl small, close to zero, you will get um, almost the original points, while very large values um, will be almost the segmentation of the whole domain. Um, so very confusing. Typically you want something between 40 and 80 percent. I'm setting it to 75 now. Okay. Um, just as a finishing touch, you can also filter the resulting regions by size. Um, um, if if they um, are just a hindrance in your visualization. So here are a few very small ones, for example. Even though they have apparently a high enough persistence, you may not be interested in them at the end, so you can filter them out with another parameter. And finally, um, the information whether a contour was associated with a minimum or maximum is also passed through and can be used, for example, for coloring. Um, so you can set the size filter here also. For example, to 10 here removes these features. And yeah, under coloring, the isMax property 
um, yeah, is available to get this color ring. So that's it. Thank you for watching this presentation. Hi everyone, I'm Jules Vidal, I'm a PhD student at Sorbonne University in Paris. I will talk about uh, briefly about distances by centers and clusters of clusters diagrams. And then we'll show you how you can compute those uh, using GTK. So let's say you want to compare two scalar fields uh, based on the repartition of their topological features. You can compute their persistence diagrams and compute a distance between those. We have a well-established matrix on the space of persistence diagrams that's called the passage time distance. And it's defined as the cost of an optimal assignment between the pairs of the two diagrams. And it can be quite expensive to compute if you have a lot of pairs in a diagram. So in GTK we use um, the auction algorithm to efficiently approximate the optimal assignments and the passage time distance. When you have a distance, you can define a barycenter of a set of input diagrams as the diagrams that will minimize the sum of its distances, of its, di of its passage time distances, to uh, the input diagrams of the sets. The motivation to compute such a barycenter is to get a diagram that uh, would be a good representative of a set of input diagrams and that will uh, encode the topology of an ensemble of scalar fields instead of one scalar field. And it can get very expensive to compute because you have to solve uh, a lot of optimal assignment problems uh, during computation. However, in GTK, we have a fast way to approximate those barycenter. It's a progressive approach uh, that's been uh, documented in a paper from last year, presented in uh, uh, at VIST 2019. And the computation is progressive, so basically at the beginning, only the most persistent features uh, of the diagrams will be added into the computation. And as time goes by, uh, a, lot, uh, a lot more persistence pairs will be added uh, in, a, in the decreasing order of persistence. So from the user point of view, uh, the method is interruptible. You can set a time constraint and you have the guarantee that when the algorithm stops, uh, the most persistent topological features will have been processed. And if you want to increase the time constraint, you will just gain more accuracy in the results. And this uh, method extends to uh, k-means clustering algorithm uh, using all progressive barycenters as the centroids of the clusters. And as well, this uh, clustering algorithm is interruptible. And uh, in the example folder of TTK, you have two uh, examples showcasing the distance computation on one part and the clustering computation on the other part. And for this uh, hands-on session, I propose to you to, to reproduce uh, two simpler versions of those pipelines, so this distance computation and the clustering computation. And the thing is that both um, both uh, things will be will be using the same uh, TTK filter that's called TTK persistence diagram clustering that takes care of the distance computation, barycenters, and clusters computation. And it takes uh, a VTK multi block dataset as an input, so you're gonna have to uh, group the input diagrams using the group dataset filter. So now moving on to the tutorial. Okay, so for the first exercise, uh, on the right this is Paraview, on the left my terminal. We'll start, we will start by opening uh, the, the Isabel dataset, Isabel.vti, in, in the tutorial data folder. Right. So uh, this is a hurricane simulation dataset with uh, 12 time steps, four at the beginning of the simulation, four uh, at the middle, and four at the end. And the scalar field is the, uh, is the magnitude of the wind velocity, so it's an ensemble dataset. Uh, with uh, three clusters basically. So we'll start by computing a persistence diagram. Uh, you can press Control and Space to to toggle the the search engine the search engine for power filters. Then you can directly search uh, for the persistence diagram filter. Uh, we'll compute it on the first scalar field. Press Apply, and here it is our first persistence diagram. Uh, we will compute another one, so selecting the, the data set, control and space, persistence diagram, and we'll select another uh, scalar field, for instance, uh, this one. Apply. So here we have uh, two persistence diagrams. 
we are going to create a multi-block dataset by selecting both of them using control and pressing uh, and uh, clicking. Then we can call the group dataset filter and apply. And here we have our VTK multi-block dataset. And on this uh, on this entry, we can call the persistence diagram clustering filter. So as I said, uh, this filter will take care of of the distance computation, but also the various centers and clustering uh, computation. So basically, here we can here you can specify the number of clusters, and if you have only one clusters and two uh, input persistence diagrams, as it is the case here, the the filter will uh, by default use the the auction algorithm to compute the vast distance. So you just need click on apply. Here it is. Um, so the Wasserstein distance is printed in the terminal. Let me increase the font size. Here it is. And in the Paraview window, uh, we have the output. So first thing we can do is change the displaying method. There's an entry in the property menu here. And you can select inspect matchings and then set some spacing. 10, for instance. Here it is. So the filter has three outputs. The first one being uh, the input persistence diagrams that we can color by uh, by ID. Here it is. The red and blue diagrams are our input diagrams that we computed just before. The second one uh, are um, is the the set of centroids or barrier centers that has been computed. Here we do not we do not need it. And third one are uh, the matchings that been that have been computed uh, to solve the assignment problems. So here we have uh, all the matchings. We can filter those by playing a threshold and only select the matching with a match number field higher than two. Uh, we'll filter the matchings and here we see only the matchings that are actually um, connecting pairs from the two diagrams. So here it is. Uh, this is the computation of a vast distance using TTK inside PowerView. Okay, now moving on uh, onto the clustering computation, you can reset uh, the PowerView scene uh, by pressing Control R or just clicking Reset Session. Okay, and then we are going to open our, a set of persistence diagrams that will be the twelve persistence diagrams that correspond to the twelve time steps of our ensemble data sets. So instead of computing those uh, into Paraview, I pre-computed them using a Python script that is included in the folder because uh, it takes a lot of time computing those in Paraview. So you can multi-select those two diagrams by pressing Shift and then uh, grouping the data sets. Okay. And then on these multi-block data sets, uh, that contains all 12 persistence diagrams, uh, you can call the persistence diagram clustering uh, filter. Okay, so now uh, we're going to set the number of clusters to be free, uh, which is the right number for this sensible data set. And as you see, uh, the time constraint here is set to one second by default. So we're going to leave it that way for the time being. Okay. So the first thing we can do is to change the display method. Uh, we're going to change it to uh, clusters as stars and we'll set the spacing. I recommend to set the spacing of two. Okay. Let's reset the view and remove the matchings. And uh, here we have our three clusters. We can color the input diagrams by uh, their cluster ID. Okay. And the result of the clustering is printed uh, in the in the in the terminal output, uh, the thing is that uh, the indices that you see here depends uh, on the order that you selected uh, the entries here. So you have to be careful when selecting the entries. And uh, looking uh, at the clusters, we see that inside each cluster, uh, the input diagrams roughly have uh, the same look and the same number of of high persistent features can be seen here. And of course, the centroid uh, globally has the same look. And uh, if we increase now the time constraints to 10 seconds here, 
going to see that a lot more of Pest and Spears will be added into the computation and uh, the, our centuries will be a little more populated by pairs. So here we go. Oh, so it took a little bit more time, two seconds instead of 10. And uh, yeah, we saw that a lot of pairs, uh, a lot of pairs and spares have been added, uh, added but uh, globally, the look of the barrier center isn't changed much. So we just gain a little more accuracy on the noise uh, of the data here. And we can see uh, as well that the result of the clustering didn't change. So yeah, that was the cluster, the computation of clustering using a, a progressive algorithm using TK. I hope you enjoyed the tutorial and thanks for watching. Attention mechanisms have greatly improved the performance of many language models. Yet with great power comes increased complexity. In this work, we present attention flows, a visualization that lets users interpret the language model's decisions and gain insights into the underlying self-attention mechanism. We also support model comparison that helps to fill the gaps between models in different training stages. As data is changing, our understanding of data should be updated correspondingly. Based on machine learning approaches, we formulate a drift level index to monitor the evolution of multi-source data, which allows users to capture and reason significant changes from time series data. The proposed visual analytics system is called Concept Explorer. More details can be found in our talk. White space surfaces are a novel approach to convey depth in vessel visualizations. The core idea is to shift all additional depth cues away from geometry and to use the usually empty space between the vascular structures. This allows us to display functional parameters on the surface and supporting cues on the background. We will explain how to generate such surfaces and how to use them as a canvas to further enhance depth and shape perception. We have seen many visualizations for tree data structures, but when showing changes in trees over time, some focus on displaying hierarchy while others highlight their changes. With split streams, we combine two approaches and their individual benefits. We evaluated our method in a user study and considered it a general purpose method for the visualization of dynamic hierarchies. Our JavaScript library is openly available. Several recent studies advocated the use of non-parametric density models for the improved characterization of data uncertainty. The non-parametric models, however, present the challenges such as increased memory and computational requirements. In this work, we propose an efficient non-parametric framework for volume rendering in the context of uncertain data and show their effectiveness in classifications via comparisons with the other statistical models. Thank you.
In our paper, we address the problem of navigating complex multiscale and dense environments, such as these molecular models. We present a technique for browsing a model by clicking on textual labels, which we call hyperlabels. This allows the user to intuitively navigate the hierarchical organization of the model. For more details, read our paper or watch the talk. We propose an interactive ensemble analysis framework that provides flexible interactive exploration of the ensemble data. Time series characteristics of data can be obtained by fast browsing time steps. The region stability heat map view shows the stability of the selected region and provides region adjustment by directly clicking. Deep neural networks are vulnerable to malicious degenerated adversarial examples. This brings high risk in applying these networks to safety critical applications. We develop a visual analytics approach to explain the root cause of such wrong predictions. Our contribution contains a constrained path extraction method, a river-based visualization, and a contribution analysis method. Serum graphs are variants of stack graphs with curved baseline, and the main factor affecting its reliability is the sign allurance through a perceptual inconsistency of the orthogonal and vertical direction. Aiming at reducing its impacts, we revisited the baseline formulation and proposed the concept of composition to help the serum graph layout optimization. The result shows that our algorithms perform better than the others. We propose a new semi-automatic method that uses topological features to guide users in tracing neurons and integrate this method within a virtual reality framework. We use the Morse smell complex to find a set of candidate neuron arcs. The candidate arcs are integrated into a VR neuron tracing system and exposed through our Morse smell complex guided semi-automatic tracing tool. The topological ridge graph underlying our MSC guided tool is robust against gaps in the signal. We asked participants to recreate bar graphs. When the bar was alone, we saw a different pattern of error than when the bar was presented with context in a stacked bar graph. We find that absolute error increased for higher bars when they were presented alone. We also found that there was a bias in the responses such that they were repulsed from an implicit 50% mark. We found a magic number, 10%, to predict error. Participants are usually within 10% of the height of the bar. SpotSDC is a visualization system that helps researchers understand the resiliency of HPC computation kernels to silent error corruptions. It gives users multiple perspectives of details with different granularity about the impact of SDC on an application's output. It also provides novel insight into how silent error propagates through a program's execution. We present Strat Graphics, an approach for designing data agnostic and fully reusable visualization templates. Strat Graphics follows the inverse workflow that common data-driven systems. Rather than starting from data, designers construct visualization structures without relying on a data schema. Data tables are shaped later from the structure of graphics. We demonstrate the power of the approach through a gallery of visualization examples. How do you visualize the nanoscale, one billionth of a meter for the public? As part of a Science Center exhibition, we developed an immersive environment that explains nanoconcepts by allowing users to explore nano properties. We reflect on how exploration, the confluence of explanatory and exploratory visualization, can be applied to visualization in public spaces.
Imagine you have tons of text data to analyze. And you want to get an overview of your data, but traditional topping modeling techniques such as LDA are not working for you. Then, why don't you try Architext? We introduce a scalable and flexible way to interactively build hierarchical topics. In our current work, we visually compare two cohorts of segmented and classified tissue images, originated from single-cell omics data. To that end, we developed data-driven and interactive workflow, implemented in a multi-linked view system. Finally, we show the effectiveness of our workflow through specific case studies. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. With the proliferation of AutoML systems, it's now easier than ever for known experts to create and deploy any trained machine learning pipelines. These systems explore the model search space and optimize hyperparameters in order to solve a particular task. We propose Pipeline Profiler, a tool that enables the exploration and comparison of machine learning pipelines produced by multiple AutoML systems. By analyzing these pipelines, we have the opportunity to better understand how AutoML systems work and obtain insights that can be used to improve them. Text alignment is a fundamental technique in many text-related domains. In this survey, we cover three text alignment scenarios, collision task, text reuse detection, and transition alignment. On the basis of those scenarios, we reviewed the existing text alignment visualization approaches and discussed their advantages and drawbacks. We finally derived design implications and shed light on related future challenges. Program developers spend significant time on optimizing and tuning applications. But working with binary code to understand what compiler optimizations were applied can be challenging. We present our visual analytics system, CCNAP, designed to identify and assess compiler optimizations in binary code. Check out our paper to learn more.
Hi everyone, I'm Lutz Hofmann. I'm a PhD student with the Visual Computing Group at Heidelberg University and I am the author of the TTK Conda package. I will be talking about how to use TTK with Python. So TTK is organized in these three layers where at the bottom we have some pure C++ code which is then wrapped into the ETK algorithm API which is then exposed to Paraview using some additional XML definitions. Um, Paraview comes with its own Python interface, which is also called PVPython, and VTK also provides a Python interface, which I will be mainly talking about. But first I would like to explain the difference between the two Python interfaces. Um, as a simple example, let's say we have some VTK unstructured grid, where we would like to execute a TTK manifold check on. Now if we use the Paraview Python interface, we would first need to get our data into the pipeline. And this can be done by creating a trivial producer and attaching our input data at, to its client side object. And this, however, only works if we are connected to the Paraview built in server. It will not work if we are connected to some remote server. Um, once we have our data as a source in the Paraview pipeline, we can then execute the TTK manifold check Paraview filter on it and um, finally also get the result out of the pipeline again using server manager fetch. This however will create a copy of the data. Now if we use the VTK Python interface on the other hand, we can directly access the VTK layer. So we can just create our TTK manifold check algorithm directly set our input data, execute it, and also similarly directly access the output object. To summarize, the Paraview Python interface modifies some global state, which is the Paraview pipeline, and it operates on the client-server architecture, while the VTK Python interface accesses the VTK layer directly, but um, comes with a more verbose syntax. Um, both of these interfaces have their own use cases. So the Paraview Python interface is useful for automating Paraview workflow. And there's also this nice feature that you can export a Paraview state as a Python script. The VTK Python interface offers a lot of more freedom. And for example, it can be used um, to create your own custom user interfaces and um, it also offers a useful number interface, which I will talk about later, and it can also be useful within Paraview itself, which I will also come back to later. So for installing the TTK Python module, the easiest way is using Conda. So um, th there's a package called Topology Toolkit provided through the Conda Forge channel, and this should just work on the major platforms. Of course, uh, you could also build TTK from source, which will then automatically detect if your VTK or Paraview installation has Python support enabled. If you would like to use the Python module from the TTK build tree, you, you need to additionally export a Python path to make the path to the Python module known to Python. So let's talk about the VTK Python interface. This interface is automatically generated from the C++ interface, which causes the VTK Python code to look very similar to C++ code. In fact, in this example that you can also find in the TTK source, I simply replaced all the arrows in the C++ code with dots in order to obtain the Python code. Now in Paraview, it would now be very simple to obtain a visualization of this computation. However, since we are now at the VTK layer, we would need to build our own rendering pipeline in VTK from scratch, which, which would generally take a few hundred lines of code. However, we can of course also use other VTK-based modules, such as PyVista, together with the TTK Python module. And um, PyVista provides a very simple API in order to get VTK rendering. VTK also comes with a NumPy interface, and this allows you to uh, wrap data that is stored in some NumPy arrays into VTK arrays. 
So for example, we could um, define a triangular mesh like here, where we define the triangles as, as the rows in this array here. Um, we define some positions also as uh, rows in an array. And we additionally need to define offsets, which um, give the index to the first um, element of each triangle in the flattened connectivity array. This is mainly used um, for VTK. And um, we can then use these um, NumPy arrays and wrap them into VTK data arrays. And here only the pointers to the internal, to the underlying data of the NumPy arrays are copied. And um, with this um, VTK NumPy interface, we can now construct a VTK unstructured grid that itself holds no data, but all data is stored in these, VTK, in these NumPy arrays. Um, since we now have a VTK object, we can apply our TTK manifold check on it and we can get the output again as a NumPy array. And um, now this NumPy array also holds no data itself, but it simply contains the pointer from the underlying data that is stored in the output object of this manifold check algorithm. So um, this provides an efficient way to access your data from within NumPy or VTK. Um, but you need to take care that the objects that own the memory are kept alive for long enough, since there's no uh, reference counting um, done here. Uh, finally, I would like to point out that the VTK Python interface is also useful in Parview, namely if you use a programmable filter or a Python plugin. So Python plugin is basically just a newer version of the programmable filter where you implement a, a VTK Python algorithm base class in a Python file, which can then be loaded directly as a plugin in Parview. And now in this uh, programmable filter or Python plugin, you of course cannot use the parview.simple API because this would modify the pipeline while the pipeline executes and it will have some unexpected results. So here you need to use this uh, VTK layer and uh, as a byproduct, um, these will also work when you're connected to a remote server. So to conclude my talk, um, the TTK Python module can be easily installed using Conda. You should try it. And I would also like to point you to the Conda Forge repository, which contains the source code for building the Conda package. And if you find a bug or you would like to contribute to the packaging, then um, you are welcome to open an issue or a pull request in this repository. Thank you for your attention. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Jonas Lukacek and I will demonstrate how you can create a new module in TTK. Before we get into the details, one has to understand the module architecture of TTK. This image here is the most important part of my presentation. It illustrates the individual components of a TTK module, where each component serves a different purpose. At the very bottom you have the so-called base component, which handles all the algorithmic heavy lifting. This is the place where you put the actual code that computes, for example, persistence pairs or merge trees. You can treat the base component as your own secret garden where you can do whatever necessary for your algorithm. Of course, if you intend to merge your module into TTK, then this still has to be reasonable. There is no strict standardization in the base component, but there are some guidelines you should follow in order to prevent data copies and to profit from TTK data structures such as the triangulation. But more about that later when we look at this component in more detail. Next, Imagine TTK would try to standardize the base code so that the outputs and inputs of individual modules can be chained and so on. In this case, TTK would actually re-implement VTK, which already provides such a pipeline concept and even features a ton of data readers, writers and algorithms. This is why TTK uses VTK to standardize the input-output data handling. For the VTK component should not contain any algorithmic logic, it should just convert an input VTK data object and parameters into a format the base component can understand, and also convert base component output again into VTK data objects. Of course, this conversion should avoid data copies and so forth. At the top of the component hierarchy, we have the Paraview component and the standalone scripts. 
where the Paraview component consists of just an XML file that describes how to represent the VTK component in the Paraview UI and the standalone scripts that just chain VTK pipelines through explicit C++ or Python code. You could also write a standalone script that chains base components, but this is much harder since now you have to take care of data formats yourself. That is why we recommend to always use the VTK layer to access modules. Alright, in short, uh, the base component does the heavy lifting, the VTK component handles I.O. standardization, the Paraview component exposes the VTK component in the Paraview UI, and standalone scripts contain explicit code that use the VTK or base components. Now that we know the module architecture, I will demonstrate how to create a new module and where you can find the individual components. First, navigate to your TTK repository. Here you can find a folder with scripts that can be used to create, clone and delete modules. Uh, you need to execute these scripts from the TTK root folder. In this example, I will create a new module named Simple Example. The create script actually clones the Hello World example and renames every occurrence of the class Hello World with the module name given to the script. You can then find the base component of the new module in the folder core base, the VTK component in core VTK. the Paraview component in the Paraview folder and finally the standalone component in the standalone folder. To build the new module we just have to run CMake again to make the build environment aware of the new module. Yeah, this will uh, take a couple of seconds. And uh, then we have to rebuild. As you can see here, a freshly created module will compile without any errors, and you can even immediately use it in Paraview. Uh, let me create a quick example of an icosphere with an elevation field. Uh, then we can pass this object into the new simple test module. All of this data I.O. will work out of the box due to the VTK interface. The Hello World module, which we cloned, uh, takes an array defined on a triangulated object and then averages the value of every vertex based on its direct neighbors. The resulting array is then named according to what is specified in the interface. Uh, next, let's have a look at the individual components that make up this module. Uh, we start with the base component that is again located in core base. Uh, by default, this component just consists of a CMake lists file an empty implementation file since the base component is templatized and a header file that is not so complicated as it might look at first. If you clone the Hello World module, you can follow a list of to-do items in order to customize the module uh, to what you actually want to accomplish. The first thing you should uh, do is to give yourself credit for this new module, so add your information here. Then let's have a look at the code. As you can see, uh, we define here in the namespace of TTK a new class named simple test that inherits from the general debug class. This will primarily provide the new class with uh, the ability to print messages. In the constructor, we simply set a prefix that will always be printed in front of these messages. Next, if your algorithm needs to perform any kind of neighborhood operations, such as fetching all outgoing edges of a specified vertex, uh, we strongly encourage you to use the TTK triangulation class that can perform such operations very efficiently. But to benefit from this efficiency, you first have to precondition the triangulation for the kind of operations you want to perform. In this example, we need to be able to fetch the direct neighbors of a vertex. The advantage of putting this preconditioning in its own method is that the preconditioning only happens once and that the time spent on the preconditioning is excluded from the timings of your algorithm. Then we come to the meat of the base component, where we do the heavy lifting. This method here is double templatized. The first template parameter represents the data type of the scalar field we are going to average, and the second template parameter corresponds to the actual triangulation type that is used to perform neighborhood operations. To explain this real quick, it is obviously faster to compute neighborhood relationships on a regular grid than on an unstructured grid, but the interface is the same. So this can be solved by inheritance, but TTK additionally templatizes over the triangulation type to gain additional performance from compile time polymorphism. So the input parameters of the compute averages method is just an array of the data template type and a TTK triangulation. 
the output parameter of the method listed in classical C++ style as the first parameter is also an array of the data template type. Note that in TTK memory should always be managed outside the base component, so this method assumes that these arrays are already initialized and of the correct size. Okay, uh, first the method prints some information about its inputs, uh, where the debug class provides a lot of convenience methods to print tables, progress statements and percent and so on. This module currently computes the average value of each vertex in parallel with OpenMP. Uh, no real magic here. Uh, notice again the convenience methods that print the current progress. Finally, the method prints some information about its results, and that is already it for the base component. Now to the VTK component, which is located in core VTK. This component consists of a CMakeList file that you should never have to modify, and two so-called module files that are required by VTK. The TTK module file lists all TTK-related dependencies, here the base component and the general TTK algorithm module. The VTK module file lists all VTK-related dependencies, in this case only the general TTK algorithm module. Usually you do not have to edit these files unless you want to use other modules. The remaining two files are the header and the implementation file of the VTK component. Let's look first at the header. You can again follow the to-do list to customize the VTK component. As you can see here, the VTK component first inherits from the general TTK algorithm class that will allow us to easily chain different VTK components. Uh, the VTK component also inherits from the base component. So think of the VTK component as the base component augmented with additional VTK related stuff. Following the to-dos, you now have to declare the parameters of your module and provide getters and setters through VTK macros. The remaining to-dos have to be completed in the implementation file. First, we need to specify the number of input and output ports in the constructor, and then define in the fill input ports information method what data types the module can process. Then we also have to specify the data object type the VTK component produces at each output port. We can either do this by forwarding the data object type of an input port or by explicitly defining the data object type. Then we come to the hardest part of the VTK component, the request data method, in which we have to convert the input VTK data objects to a format the base component can understand, then call the base component and finally convert the base component output into VTK data objects. I could fill an entire session talking about this process, but due to time restrictions I can just recommend that you work through the provided comments and let us know if you have questions. I just want to point out that this is the actual call to the base code through a macro that automatically templatizes over the data type and the triangulation type. The final call then just passes the data in the form of the correct pointers down to the base component. To expose the VTK component and its parameters in the Paraview UI, we have to provide an XML file in the Paraview folder. The CMake file next to it you should never have to touch. In the XML file you can provide some documentation and specify which uh, parameters are exposed, again what data types the VTK component can process and so on. This is not well documented, so the best thing you can do is to look at other XML files and copy paste the parts you need. Finally, we have a quick look at the standalone component, which allows us to run the new module from the terminal. The standalone programs are also ideal for tests, such as for memory leaks. The default standalone component consists of a CMakeList file that also demonstrates how to integrate TTK in other C++ projects and a script uh, that based on its input parameters reads an input VTK data object, feeds it into the new module and then stores the results to disk, uh, where the pipeline can be coded as any other VTK pipeline. This concludes my talk and I thank you for your attention. Goodbye. Hello and welcome to my talk on integrating TTK into InVivo. My name is Martin Falk and I'm with Linköping University, Sweden. I'm assuming that all of you are at least somewhat familiar with TTK, which leaves the question, what is InVivo? InVivo is a research-focused visualization framework developed by groups at Linköping University, Ulm University and KTH. It is a rapid prototyping tool for creating arbitrary visualizations using a combination of C++, Python, JavaScript and HTML. Initially, InVivo was targeted only towards medical imaging, mostly relying on volume rendering techniques. 
But over the past couple of years, the functionality has been steadily growing. And now in Vivo supports a wide variety of different visualization techniques, covering things like, for example, vector field visualization, molecular vis, and since we now also have a TTK binding, topology based methods as well. From a technical point of view, in Vivo has a pure C++ core, which provides the basic functionality for everything. On top of that, we have a modular plugin layer, um, providing us with the functionality of uh, wrapping external libraries, like for example, OpenGL, Python and OpenCL, but also to uh, be able to easily extend in vivo's functionality as you can see here for example we have a vector field visualization module which then depends on base gl and open gl as well as brushing and linking on top of this we have then the application layer basically the front end for the user in vivo is shipped with a network editor and a python interface but this layer then also allows you to easily create your own application on top of our framework. Um, since we have this plugin architecture, in vivo supports a wide variety of different data formats. Let it be imaging data like DICOM, H5, TIFF stacks, or even raw format. Then um, we have some mesh support via a simp. And at the moment, we are also currently working on integrating the VTK data format. The underlying principle of InVivo is a visualization pipeline, or as we call it, a processor network, which models a data flow graph. So in this example here, we have a volume source reading a file from disk, and then this data is propagated down through the network to this volume rendering processor before the result is shown in the canvas. Each of these boxes, um, basically correspond to their own algorithm or function. We also call them uh, processors. And each of these processes only depends on the inputs coming from above. So in a sense, this whole pipeline is basically a function. Um, and hence, we can then also say that or consider it as a stateless function. In practice, this is not entirely true because the outputs of each process are cached to avoid um, unnecessary recomputation. And then only when the data is changed or some parameters change, then we trigger a recomputation of those parts in the network. In order to create such networks, you can use the network editor, as I have mentioned earlier, which is shipped um, with in vivo. And the editor consists of the following parts. On the left hand side, we have a list of all available processors, that is all the functions um, available to build a visualization pipeline. You can then drag and drop these into the central area to build your own processor network. And then the output is rendered in its own canvas. In order to adjust parameters of your processes here, for example, we have selected the volume rendering. Um, you can do this via the property list. For example, here we can then tweak the transfer function or also adjust the sampling rate and camera, camera parameters. So much on the overview on in vivo. Now let's get into how we actually integrate a TTK into it. Uh, small disclaimer here, we are only working with the core API of TTK, that is the C++ side. And thus we don't have a support for the VTK and Paraview plugins of TTK. In the beginning, we started out with the TTK C++ example, where we basically read a input geometry apply some topology methods and then output the resulting geometry. In practice, um, we have basically put the entire code of that pro um, example into one of these processors. 
The only thing pointing out here is that since we are dealing with data coming from in vivo down the network, we have to convert our data into a TTK representation before we then can start um, computing, for example, the persistence curve, the persistence diagram and the simplification. And then at towards the end, we convert the TTK representation back into something in vivo understands, so we can render it on on the canvas. So for a starting point, this is quite good. Um, but you don't want to repeat these TTK calls all over the place. So we decided to split up this functionality into multiple processors. As you can see here now in this example, we now have a processor responsible for the conversion. And then we have these individual steps like persistence diagram and the simplification before we convert the data back um, to in vivo. On the code side, um, basically what was required there is that we have several conversion functions to convert data from in vivo to TTK. And at the moment we support meshes and volumes and then create the corresponding TTK triangulation out of it. In order to pass on the data to the next processors, we wrap the TTK data structures here, for example, the TTK triangulation in its own object. And then um, each processor can output that stuff and the next one can read it into. This principle allows us then also to easily extend it. Um, here we have added another conversion to a data frame, which allows us then, for example, when computing the persistence curve in TTK that we then create these corresponding values and then use the plotting functionality available in in vivo to create a persistence curve plot or a persistence diagram. Let's now have a look at how that looks in in vivo. Here we have a volume source converted to a triangulation and then compute a more smell complex, which we then render with points and lines. And now we go ahead and add a simplification process by simply dragging it in. And those familiar with TTK might know that you need a persistence diagram in order to perform the simplification. So we add that one as well. And now we can adjust the threshold of the simplification and then look at the result interactively. In order to also show the result of the triangulation, we hook that up to our visualization as well. Since those lines are quite jagged, we took the liberty of creating another processor for refinement of those separatrices, which is basically using a spring system, um, drawing these separatrices um, along the gradients. So we pull in a processor computing the gradients of the input geometry. And then we can adjust the number of iterations in the spring system and thus um, get smoother separatrices for visualization purposes, that is. And of course, we can then go back and adjust the simplification threshold. Here's another example where we apply TTK here we compute also the Morse mail complex, this time of a charge density field um, of iron oxide. As you can see here, we have lots of atoms and separatrices in there. Um, this is then why we came up with this separatrix refiner. And then we can do things like here. Um, here you see a sodium chloride charge density um, in combination with the refinement resulting in a nice regular structure. To summarize our experiences um, with TTK, they have been quite positive. The first thing to point out is that TTK is quite modular, which proved to be quite um, helpful for us because we could then start implementing individual functions, like for example, the, the simplification or the persistence diagram. Um, and then 
get started slowly instead of having to implement the entire interface at once. However, we learned quickly that TTK is mostly targeted towards VTK and Paraview, which in itself is um, quite a good thing. However, under the hood, um, you quickly stumble upon some strange things. Like for example, the interface to some functions can be, therefore be quite extensive. In case of the more smale function, you actually need to provide 15 different arrays as an input um, in order to call just one single function. And thus it would be quite handy to actually have access to the internal data structures used by TTK because there there is only one or two objects around maintaining the entire state. If that had made you curious um, and you want to try out in vivo yourself, um, I would recommend you visit the GitHub repository of InVivo. Um, or if you just want to check out the binaries, then you can find those on our webpage. Unfortunately, so far without the TTK support, if you want to have the TTK functionality and InVivo, then you have to check out the modules repository, where you can then also find detailed instructions of what you need to do and set up in order to get both up and running. With this, I would like to wrap, wrap up and conclude my talk. Thank you for listening. Hi, everyone. My name is Josh Ledeen, and I'm a faculty member at University of Arizona. And in this talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about using the Topological Toolkit uh, as a platform for teaching a variety of courses. In particular, we surveyed a few courses where TTK had been taught in the last couple of years. And in, these courses generally ended up being graduate student level courses that were a mix of topics on computer science and data analysis. Uh, I'm going to focus most of my talk on a course that I taught in fall 2017 that used TTK pretty much exclusively for all the data analysis in the course. Uh, but I've also uh, looked at information from courses that were taught at UPMC Sorbonne, as well as Utah. Uh, where TTK was used in part with other data analysis uh, topics. For example, the course at Sorbonne uses both TTK and Goody to do topological analysis. Generally speaking, the students in this course uh, were graduate students who were at either the master's or PhD level. Uh, and we typically had fairly minimal pre prerequisites. So students, we expected to have some kind of limited mathematical background for which we covered some of the topological concepts using TTK. And we also generally expected them to be computer science students, which meant that they had some kind of background in coding, hopefully in C and C++, which is the major language used to do most of the development of TTK. That said, in some cases, we had students who were majoring in other areas who chose to come to the course. And in particular, in my course, I had a couple of students who were uh, coming from backgrounds more like applied math or information science who also sat in the course and were able to gain quite a bit about their understanding of topological analysis along the way. So I'm going to spend a few minutes describing my course. And in particular, I want to describe why I chose to use TTK within the course and what were the sorts of things I hope to get out of it. And to understand that better, I think it's helpful to know a couple of the goals of my course. And the first main goal of this course that I taught, it was a special topic seminar on topological analysis. And I wanted to introduce students to broadly the field of topological analysis along the way. As a result, we actually spent quite a long period of time in the book, um, about 10 weeks or two thirds of the course. This is 30 hours total of lecture and kind of reading group time, uh, where we covered the vast majority of Edelsbrunner and Harris book, Computational Topology and Introduction. And we covered this on both a theoretical level in terms of reading the book and going through kind of the proofs and theorems in there. But we also actually demoed examples from the books as well to kind of use TTK to reinforce the theater theoretical concepts with practical examples as well. And one of my favorite instances of this is we were talking about the course, or talking about the book rather, and we were going through this idea of using persistence and image segmentation, which appears in chapter nine of the textbook. And we're reading through this section and talking about it, and you see this image on the right that appears in the book in black and white, where they're looking at a confocal microscopy image of basically it's embryos of fruit flies. And you see this wonderful cellular structure that shows up in the image. And we asked the question, oh, well, could we actually do that segmentation right now? And as I was, as we were talking about this, you know, I, I plugged my computer into the projector, we started talking about it, and I ended up saying, yeah, we can definitely do this with TTK along the way. 
And what I did was I downloaded the data set. You can actually find it pretty easily if you Google the paper reference that you see here below. And then I, with a little bit of data wrangling, loaded up the data in TTK, and you have the resulting network that you see here, where we took the data, we did a small amount of persistent simplification, and from there we used the more smell complex to do the segmentation, effectively recovering the cellular structure under some level of simplification, of course, um, in a kind of uh, a recreation of the promise that's in the textbook as you start to talk about using topological structures for segmentation. And this was pretty cool because we were able to whip it together in really just a few minutes. Of course, it's rough and dirty, and there's kind of uh, or quick and dirty rather, and it's rough around the edges, but it kind of shows the main concept of doing that segmentation along the way. And this was pretty exciting, I think, to both me and also the students that were able to do this kind of on the fly in the middle of class. As a result, actually, if you go to TTK's website right now, you'll see this is an exact demo online that you can go and play around with. The second goal of my course was to help students gain knowledge about how topological analysis is used, particularly in the field of visualization, but more generally to do analysis of data. So as a result, the last third of the course, uh, we actually spent some time surveying research papers associated with topological analysis, and students completed final projects based on these assignments. So students both used the TTK to reinforce the theoretical concepts that show up in Herbert and John's book, but also to do more practical and applied concepts to see how this was used in true data analysis settings. So how exactly did students use TTK? Well, generally speaking, there were two types of assignments in my courses. The first types of assignments were really just to understand key concepts and structures in topological analysis. To do this, I used a mix of TTK exercises, but also written exercises from uh, Herbert and John's book. And in particular, these were things that were kind of common usage tasks for data analysis, using persistent homology to do data simplification, building topological structures that do summarization of data, using these structures to do things like segmentation of scientific data. The next set of assignments were really all about coding new modules that did not yet exist in TTK that were either extracting new data structures or extracting um, new features along the way, or recreating structures that are existed in TTK so that students could get, be more comfortable trying to understand exactly how TTK chose to implement them and try to understand kind of issues with robustness and kind of how do you do the implementation of these things. So you see on this list, we did things like Betty numbers and Victoria's Rips complexes, but also critical point extraction. And we actually did an approximation of the piecewise Morse, uh, Morse Fell complex or the Morse complex in particular, um, because the TTK implementation uses the uh, discrete form and theory version of this. And I wanted to show the students kind of how difficult it is to do the piecewise linear one. Generally speaking, all these assignments were to try to gain mastery in both implementing topological tools and then using them for data analysis. And here's a few slides that just show a couple examples of the sorts of things that students put together. This is a great example of using TTK to implement an object that you could then compare to a different object using pair view. And in particular, in the image that you see here, on the left is the implementation of a student's uh, Vitoris Rips complex uh, module, and that's the TTK Vitoris Rips complex that you see. And on the right, you actually see Paraview's Delaunay 3D module, which has features to allow you to extract alpha shapes, and you can set the threshold for what alpha you want. So students were able to kind of compare the difference between VR complexes and alpha shapes side by side using Paraview to kind of work with and visualize the structures that they're doing. In the next assignment that I mentioned, students were working with critical point extraction and classification. So basically they used TTK's data structures to do a built-in filter that just spat out a set of points associated with um, the critical points of the scalar field by doing a local computation to say, is this point above or below its, its adjacent things. As a result from this, students saw a bunch of complexities and nuances in the degenerate cases that kind of show up here, especially for things like saddles, where it's somewhat tricky to identify the type and index of the saddle. And you can see here for this data set, there's a lot of critical points being shown up on the, on the right-hand side. And that has a lot to do with the numerics of the data set as well as the geometric robustness of trying to abstract critical points. Here's a picture of them using uh, the output of one TTK filter as an input for a new filter they created. And in doing so, they actually did the piecewise linear walk for extracting, ascending, and descending manifolds, or the Morse complex of the data set. So this passed in a set of points. And then from there, the students walked along the triangles using a breath for search to extract things like the ascending manifolds you see on the left, or the descending manifolds you see here on the right. They also were able to use Paraview to combine these filters with other features. And in particular here, you see an instance where they used the Morse, the Morse complex that they extracted and to segment the volume associated with the data. And then they evaluated this by taking isosurfaces and effectively doing the intersection in Paraview to try to see which regions of the isosurface are associated with which segments of the Morse complex. Real quick, I want to talk about some of the final projects that students used in TTK. And here's just a list of some of the things that they did, which were generally either trying to do computational improvements to things, like trying to do faster extraction of RIP complex, or comparing variants of contour trees to the implementation in TTK, 
or implementing new papers along the way. And the last two, shape matching and Pareto extreme extraction, are examples of those two. And I want to highlight those. Here's the output of one of the students' projects where they basically implemented this paper from 2013 by Hutenberg et al. Burger and all rather, that does multi-field scalar topology based on Pareto optimality. So this passes in multiple scalar fields and then labels the domains based on their Pareto optimality, which gives you some notion of things like shared critical points among the scalar topology. A second instance of this is a student chose to implement Thomas and Nadarajan's uh, 2014 paper on multi-scale symmetry detection in scalar fields. And the way this works is you cluster contours, but you rely on a description of the contours, in this case, the contour tree, to give you classifications of them for which you would cluster. And what's cool about this is the student was able to uh, take both the output of the algorithm uh, and feed it into pair view, but then also visualize the output and see this kind of symmetric structure that shows up in the data set through pretty straightforward experiments along the way. To wrap up, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the feedback that I got from students and discuss some of the things moving forward for this. And in particular, I surveyed students along the way using our course evaluation tools, and students really did like using the programming assignments to kind of reinforce the topological material along the way. I also got really lucky. I had a student in my class who just was a fan of topology, so you can see here they put in their comments that they love topology. It's kind of one of the things that they thought was great about the course. I also had some suggestions along the way that suggest that TTK is actually pretty difficult from a programming language point of view for students to work with. I'm pretty excited though that in the last year, uh, we've done a lot of work on taking TTK and basically mapping it into a Python library using, Anac using Anaconda. And I think students now have a lot of options in terms of being a developer of TTK or being a consumer of TTK, which would make a future course like this a lot easier to teach. And with that, I'll wrap up my talk. Um, I wanna thank you all for paying attention and if you uh, are interested in using TTK for a course you want to teach, or if you have taught TTK um, in a course previously, I'd love to hear some of your feedback on it too. So please drop me a line and send me an email or either find my contact info on my website and let me know or let us know rather how you've been using TTK to teach topological analysis and data analysis more broadly. Thanks everyone. So I will now conclude this uh, tutorial. So the take home messages to, to remember from this tutorial are as follows. If you have some data on meshes or things that can be meshed, and if you want to extract, measure, and compare features of interest in a fast and robust manner, then topological data analysis can help. And for this, uh, TTK is an easy to use, efficient, and versatile tool. As mentioned before, we support many analysis tasks and for many types of data, uh, scalar, bivariate, uncertain, point cloud data, and time varying data. As mentioned also in the tutorial, creating a new module for TTK is very easy, and the byproduct of that is that one can use TTK as a research platform. As a matter of fact, uh, that was our initial motivation for developing TTK. We wanted to have a software platform within which it would be easy to implement and extend our research. In particular, before its public release, uh, we have been using TTK internally for two years to produce our papers. And back then, five graduate students uh, worked with it on a daily basis. And although they had C++ programming skills already, they had no background in user interfaces, rendering pipelines, or other uh, graphical aspects. So TTK here was really uh, helpful for them in the sense that they only had to focus on the topological aspects of their research without having to deal with all the peripheral aspects such as rendering or uh, I.O. So for them, it was a, uh, a big time saver to use TTK. And uh, they happened to, to get very qu quickly up to speed and independent with TTK. And, and now, it, usually for a new student, it roughly takes between uh, one and two weeks to get independent uh, with TTK. So we really encourage you to, to consider using TTK as your research platform, and if so, we'll be very ha happy to, to help you distribute your research code with uh, TTK. Thanks to the uh, Python API and the Parv user interface, uh, we've been using TTK for teaching as well to uh, produce figures for the lecture materials, but also for the hands-on sessions with uh, the students. As I mentioned in the tutorial introduction, there seems to be some interest out there, especially in other fields of science, such as uh, chemistry, material sciences, or uh, astrophysics, to name a few. And there seems to be some interest for the topology toolkit. 
And I believe this is an opportunity for our research community to showcase the techniques and algorithms that we develop as a community and to show uh, this technology to the rest of the world. And for this, uh, TTK can be a nice uh, receptacle for the research code of our research community. So again, I really invite you to consider using TTK as a research platform for that purpose. Finally, I'd like to uh, remind that to be useful, uh, TTK needs you. Uh, it needs its user and developer community. And here, everybody can help and everybody's welcome for testing, uh, for uh, writing tutorials, for contributing to the code, and, and in short, for, for everything. And again, for those of you who do research in data analysis and visualization, please consider using TTK as a research platform. We believe this will make your life easier and our community stronger. And with this, I'd like to conclude this uh, tutorial. Uh, thank you for watching it. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the contributors to, uh, to TTK. And I also advertise the fact that we are currently recruiting a small group here at Sorbonne to work on TTK. So if you are interested, uh, feel free to, to contact me. So again, uh, thanks to all the TTK contributors and thanks uh, for watching this tutorial. Bye-bye. Attention mechanisms have greatly improved the performance of many language models, yet with great power comes increased complexity. In this work, we present attention flows, a visualization that lets users interpret the language model's decisions and gain insights into the underlying self-attention mechanism. We also support model comparison that helps to fill the gaps between models in different training stages. As data is changing, our understanding of data should be updated correspondingly. Based on machine learning approaches, we formulate a drift level index to monitor the evolution of multi-source data, which allows users to capture and reason significant changes from time series data. The proposed visual analytics system is called Concept Explorer. More details can be found in our talk. White space surfaces are a novel approach to convey depth in vessel visualizations. The core idea is to shift all additional depth cues away from geometry and to use the usually empty space between the vascular structures. This allows us to display functional parameters on the surface and supporting cues on the background. We will explain how to generate such surfaces and how to use them as a canvas to further enhance depth and shape perception. We have seen many visualizations for tree data structures, but when showing changes in trees over time, some focus on displaying hierarchy, while others highlight their changes. With split streams, we combine two approaches and individual benefits. We evaluated our method in a user study and considered it a general purpose method for the visualization of dynamic hierarchies. Our JavaScript library is openly available. Several recent studies advocated the use of non-parametric density models for the improved characterization of data uncertainty. The non-parametric models, however, present the challenges such as increased memory and computational requirements. In this work, we propose an efficient non-parametric framework for volume rendering in the context of uncertain data and show their effectiveness in classifications via comparisons with the other statistical models. Thank you.
In our paper, we address the problem of navigating complex multiscale and dense environments, such as these molecular models. We present a technique for browsing a model by clicking on textual labels, which we call hyperlabels. This allows the user to intuitively navigate the hierarchical organization of the model. For more details, read our paper or watch the talk. We propose an interactive ensemble analysis framework that provides flexible interactive exploration of the ensemble data. Time series characteristics of data can be obtained by fast browsing time steps. The region stability heat map view shows the stability of the selected region and provides region adjustment by directly clicking. Deep neural networks are vulnerable to malicious degenerated adversarial examples. This brings high risk in applying these networks to safety critical applications. We develop a visual analytics approach to explain the root cause of such wrong predictions. Our contribution contains a constrained path extraction method, a river-based visualization, and a contribution analysis method. Serum graphs are variants of stack graphs with curved baseline, and the main factor affecting its reliability is the sign allurance through a perceptual inconsistency of the orthogonal and vertical direction. Aiming at reducing its impacts, we revisited the baseline formulation and proposed the concept of composition to help the serum graph layout optimization. The result shows that our algorithms perform better than the others.
Attention mechanisms have greatly improved the performance of many language models, yet with great power comes increased complexity. In this work, we present attention flows, a visualization that let users interpret the language model's decisions and gain insights into the underlying self-attention mechanism. We also support model comparison that helps to fill the gaps between models in different training stages. As data is changing, our understanding of data should be updated correspondingly. Based on machine learning approaches, we formulate a drip-level index to monitor the evolution of multi-source data, which allows users to capture and reason significant changes from time-series data. The proposed visual analytics system is called Concept Explorer. More details can be found in our talk. White space surfaces are a novel approach to convey depth in vessel visualizations. The core idea is to shift all additional depth cues away from geometry and to use the usually empty space between the vascular structures. This allows us to display functional parameters on the surface and supporting cues on the background. We will explain how to generate such surfaces and how to use them as a canvas to further enhance depth and shape perception. We have seen many visualizations for tree data structures, but when showing changes in trees over time, some focus on displaying hierarchy, while others highlight their changes. With split streams, we combine two approaches and their individual benefits. We evaluated our method in a user study and considered it a general purpose method for the visualization of dynamic hierarchies. Our JavaScript library is openly available. Several recent studies advocated the use of non-parametric density models for the improved characterization of data uncertainty. The non-parametric models, however, present the challenges such as increased memory and computational requirements. In this work, we propose an efficient non-parametric framework for volume rendering in the context of uncertain data and show their effectiveness in classifications via comparisons with the other statistical models. Thank you.
In our paper, we address the problem of navigating complex multiscale and dense environments, such as these molecular models. We present a technique for browsing a model by clicking on textual labels, which we call hyperlabels. This allows the user to intuitively navigate the hierarchical organization of the model. For more details, read our paper or watch the talk. We propose an interactive ensemble analysis framework that provides flexible interactive exploration of the ensemble data. Time series characteristics of data can be obtained by fast browsing time steps. The region stability heat map view shows the stability of the selected region and provides region adjustment by directly clicking. Deep neural networks are vulnerable to malicious degenerated adversarial examples. This brings high risk in applying these networks to safety critical applications. We develop a visual analytics approach to explain the root cause of such wrong predictions. Our contribution contains a constrained path extraction method, a river-based visualization, and a contribution analysis method. Serum graphs are variants of stack graphs with curved baseline, and the main factor affecting its reliability is the sign allurance through a perceptual inconsistency of the orthogonal and vertical direction. Aiming at reducing its impacts, we revisited the baseline formulation and proposed the concept of composition to help the serum graph layout optimization. The result shows that our algorithms perform better than the others.